All right. Hello. Welcome. I think that this is part 15 of question mark uh, of me making a WebAssembly interpreter, interpreter even. Good start in Ruby. Um, I'm doing this to have fun. I'm doing it to demystify WebAssembly if for myself, if nobody else. Um, I'm doing it to share how I do it. Um, I'm the main purpose of this is to have fun. So I'm trying to prioritize having fun over building something that is a complete implementation of WebAssembly. Um, I'm trying to prioritize correctness over cleverness. I'm trying to prioritize clarity over cleverness. Um, well, correctness over performance is what I meant to say. And then clarity over cleverness. I've done this intro so many times and I, I still can't remember what it is. Um, I'm trying to do it in pure Ruby. I know that I say that. And I'm also trying to do it without any dependencies. I know that I say that. So that's all the things I say <laughs> when I'm doing this. Um, as always, uh, I'm going to do a quick retro because I've had a chance to think about um, what I did last time. Um, so two things really. Firstly, um, I got all the instruction unfolding done, which is great. Um, I'm surprised that it wasn't more painful than it was. Um, and now everything works. So that's excellent. Um, it's exciting to have bottomed out my sort of clumsy piecemeal understanding of WebAssembly syntax. Now I do feel like I really understand the, the plain text syntax of programs, um, how they're written, what the syntax means. You know, this has forced me to understand the details of that. So that's great. Um, and you know, the fact that I can execute more tests successfully is also very good. You know, that, um, I suppose it's a bit of a milestone that that float expras.wast file um, is finally all passing, which feels like a massive relief because I've been stuck on that or I've been stuck on 99% on that test for ages. Um, and plus I think that's all of the floating point tests officially done now. Um, so yeah, that's that was the last thing that was stopping me from saying we're completely done with floating point numbers, but I think we're completely done with them now. So that's great. Um, it would have been nice to have a slightly more gentle ramp up to that tau function at the end that forced me to completely sort of turn my interpreter inside out to make it work. But admittedly, what I am doing here is not at all what was intended. Um, you know, those executable specifications for WebAssembly were not designed for someone to use them in this way. So I can kind of kind of deal with that. Um, but yeah, that's it. Uh, that's, you know, unfolding is done. It works. That's great. Um, I think, you know, the flip side of that is that towards the end of the previous stream, sort of drunk on a heady mixture of success and sleep deprivation, I made a start on that if dot wast test. But in hindsight, I think that was a bit silly or at least sort of overly optimistic. Um, you know, pretty much all the stuff I did in the last stream was probably more painful than it should have been because all the time I was making changes to the unfolding code, I was also having to make changes to the evaluator. And that meant that every change necessitated two or three, you know, copies of the same modification. Um, and that just feels like it's going to make progress very slow. And it means that I've got multiple places in my code that have to care about the static arity of instructions. And it's just, it just feels very painful. So I want to insulate any future changes, you know, attempts to make future tests pass. I want them to be insulated from the idiosyncrasies of the concrete syntax. So I've decided it's time to pull off that band aid and introduce an abstract syntax now before I sort of waste any more time on an evaluator that is also a parser for the concrete syntax. Cause that's having those two concerns commingled like this is just making it too hard for me to make progress in a, in a sort of timely fashion. Um, so yeah, I want to introduce the abstract syntax. I think the WebAssembly spec has got some things to say about abstract syntax. So I could maybe 
go and have a look at that <laughs> and see what it says. Um, if I can get the abstract syntax working, then that would, then having that sort of extra step, that, that sort of abstraction layer, um, would introduce the tantalizing possibility of being able to parse the binary dot wasm format into an AST and execute that. But I think I'll resist that until I need it, or at least until I've got basic language features like if working. Um, I think that's it. I don't think I had anything else to say about that. Um, no, that's it. So let's just get stuck in. Um, I will do the ceremonial running of the tests. Um, but yeah, I think where we're at is that all of these, everything that's got an F or a float at the beginning is now passing. Um, we're sort of onto this if dot wast, which is currently pending. I like I said, I well, I didn't say this, but what I thought was I slightly regret moving on to this because now I've got this big failure in my face saying that multi basically you can see just looking at this assert, you can see what's happening here is that it's asserting that the return value of invo invoking invoking multi with zero is these two values so clearly there's something going on here where we need to be able to support multiple return values from a function which isn't too big a deal because return values come on the stack um so that seems like that should be eminently doable but um yeah like i said i'm really nervous about charging on into you know the reason I said it was overly optimistic before is because the reason I got into this in the first place is because I thought, oh, if dot wast must almost be completely passing, I bet there's just one or two tiny changes I can make and then that whole file is going to be passing and that turned out to not be true. Like, I, I think I squashed a couple of problems in this, but now there's this problem and, and you know, I've no confidence that there aren't, you know, another 10 esoteric things like multiple return values that are sort of... I mean, arguably, like, is that a test of if? I don't know, not really, but this is where it gets exercised. Uh, at least this is the first time we've seen multiple return values get exercised. So, uh, yeah, I think I'm resolved to sort of back away from that now. Focus on the abstract syntax for a bit, and then hopefully it'll be easier to come back to this and, and I'll feel more able to sort of take on more challenging things. Um without just, you know, feeling like I've got to give up because it's too difficult, because I don't have an abstract syntax. Um, so, yeah, there are really two things I wanted to do today. Um, one of them is to... Oh, yeah, I was just trying to find where they were. I had some to-dos here. Um, I think I did this. Don't reassign static offset unnecessarily. Um, I think I did that as part of some other work. Yeah, there used to be a, a pointless static offset equals here, and I took that out, so that's, that one's done. Um, there's some small bits and pieces here to do with renaming stuff. Um, th these three items are things... So everything above this point was stuff that I already had here. Um, since last time I went back and reread the code and I thought about some feedback to give myself, which is um, dealing with nillable values more neatly inside unfold, uh, which is just a small change. Um, always return an array of expressions. That's also a very small change. Uh, sorry, always return an expression, which is an array of instructions uh, from unfold. That's also a very small change. That's more of a principle um, thing than a practice thing. Um, and then this last one is potentially a little bit meatier but i want to i want to do that as well because the other thing that i want to do is introduce an ast and so again i wrote myself up a little to-do list here so i'm like what i want is to have i don't know if this is necessarily the right class name but make up some kind of class that is going to be responsible for parsing and what i mean here is it gets in an s expression from the s expression parser so the s expression parser gets a string and emits an s expression this ast parser is going to pick up the s expression and emit some kind of abstract syntax tree hence the t 
Um, so I want to sort of introduce and integrate into the evaluator, the interpreter, you know, an empty unfold. Um, oh, this shouldn't be evaluate expression. This should be parse expression, of course. It's called evaluate expression in the evaluator, but we want it to be parse expression in the parser. Um, in fact, I don't think it is called evaluate expression. I think it's just called evaluate. That's actually a, quite a bad decision on my part. I think when I started doing this, I didn't realize that what I was doing was evaluating, ex evaluating an expression. At the moment, evaluation is actually sort of broken up between this stuff up here in interpret, which should just be called interpret script. Um, I think I have a to do for that. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna rename it because every time I see it, I think, well, that's not got the right name. Um, so yeah, I think that's it. Um, yeah, so evaluation is sort of split up between interpret script and you know, because here, this is a similar, we're, we're, we're doing a case statement, we're matching on, is this a module or a function or a memory or a invoke or whatever. So this is essentially evaluating those actions at the top level in the script. Um, and what I didn't realize when I started this is that th this is really, this is sort of the de declarative fragment of WebAssembly, sort of like in, you know, in Java, you've got the sort of the declarative static part of the language that is you know, class definitions and field definitions and things like that, interfaces and stuff. And then you've got the actual expression language um, that is the thing that you direct, directly evaluate that's, you know, statements and things like that. Um, and we've got a similar sort of thing in WebAssembly where there's this, or at least in these WebAssembly scripts, but I think, I think modules are like, I think modules are like the unit of deployment of WebAssembly. So really what it means to interpret WebAssembly is sort of to execute or to interpret one of these module definitions. And right now, like I'm, I'm doing the module stuff up here inside interpret script. And then it's only when we actually hit a function body um, or less significantly like these arguments in a cert return that we actually that we find expressions and then we punt those off to this uh evaluate function um if i can find it uh so yeah anyway um sorry i got distracted by the interpret script thing not important at all but it's that just tipped over a threshold where I couldn't deal with that anymore. Um, uh, rename interpret to interpret script um, because that's what it does. Evaluate is responsible for evaluating expressions. Maybe we should rename that method to, uh, why don't I just do that? Uh, no. Do I want to do that? How many how many places does it get called? I'll leave it for now. I'll leave it for now. It's not, sorry, I'm I'm getting distracted. What I wanted to say was, I want to hook up this sort of dummy AST parser, and then I want to start doing this. I don't see any reason why I can't just move unfold into that AST parser. Like if all if initially this starts out as it does nothing, then I think it's okay to then say, well, because it'll still, it, it's it's getting an S expression in and it, it will be an identical S expression out. Um, I don't think it matters where this unfold method lives. Like unfold is a bit of an interloper in the interpreter right now in that it doesn't use any of the rest of the interpreter. It is just a pure function on arrays of instructions um and apart from calling itself recursively i don't think it i don't think it depends on anything else in this class so it'd be very easy to just lift this out and stick it into the ast parser and say that um well where i want to get to is that the s expression stops 
the S expressions stop at the AST parser and what comes out of the AST parser is just some other data type, right? I, I'm not, I haven't really thought about what the AST should look like, but it should not be just an S expression. I want it to be a richer representation than that. So I'll move unfold into the AST parser and then the same work will just be being done in a different place. Uh, that's just moving the furniture around really. But then the bit that is a bit more painful is basically start moving pieces of the evaluate method here. Oh, this, again, this should be parse expression here. Um, because this evaluate method is actually a mixture of concerns. It is. It does eventually do some evaluating. Um, I mean, maybe the maybe the structured instructions are the best example. Like, oh, let's look at if. Like for if, this is the part that does the evaluating. Is like it pops the condition off the stack. It checks to see whether it's zero, and then it recursively evaluates either the alternative or the consequent. Well, yeah, the consequent or the alternative. Um, that's the evaluating bit. But then you've got all of this preamble that involves finding the syntactic limits of that condition, you know, looking for the end in this case, and then um, splitting on else. And that's all just parsing. So what I want to do is rather than have this evaluate function be like a single a single function that takes an S expression and has a side effect that is evaluating that S expression and you know modifying the contents of the stack is really the only side effect that we care about. Um, instead, what I want to do is to stage that computation, to split it into two pieces so that there's a sort of an initial stage that is just the parsing work and then you get a sort of a residual kind of a residual program in the middle but you know you get a residue from the parsing that is that communicates all of the information you need to then hook up the second part which is the actual evaluating and that residue is going to be the abstract syntax tree so sort of just by taking this big knotted clump of computation and like teasing it apart into two pieces and then the sort of connective tissue between those two pieces in this disgusting analogy is going to be the abstract syntax tree rather than at the moment there is no data representation of that thing it's just all sort of mixed together as part of this single unnecessarily conflated computation that is take an s expression in and have a side effect. I want to pull those apart and say, take an S expression in, produce some other data in the middle, that's the abstract syntax, and then that's going to be communicated to the other piece of the, like the second stage of the computation, which is actually evaluating that and having a side effect. But I think, you know, uh, I'm not inventing this idea as I'm talking about it, like this is the obvious way to do it. And the only reason I haven't done it this way is because I haven't really needed to up until now like I've managed to pull myself up by my bootstraps until this point just directly evaluating that um that s expression but as I've said many times I think the I think I'm long overdue um that connective tissue in these two separated stages of computation rather than having this one big sort of complected mass uh that's trying to do uh that's trying to do everything so yeah, that's what I want to do is, and again, I, I'm going to, like with everything else I've done recently, all of the difficult, or to, to me, intimidating changes, um, I would like to do it incrementally, ideally. So rather than trying to do it, whereas it's easy, I think, to just move all of Unfold over, because this is not complected with anything. It's not, this is completely, a completely independent part that I can just lift wholesale and plop into a different class. That'll be fine. But teasing out the individual pieces of this evaluate method, I think is going to be, is going to be a bit messy. And so what I want to do is sort of pick on one piece at a time. So, I mean, things like return, for example, like that's really easy. Um, I just need to pass some piece of the connective tissue here just needs to be some piece of data that says it's a return instruction. So that could be, oh, you know, when I've, when I've got something looking like this over in the AST parser, you know, maybe it just 
returns a thing that says, you know, the name of this instruction is return, you know, if I want to represent it with a hash, or maybe I do some kind of like return dot new if I want to have some kind of, you know, classes to represent the AST nodes or whatever, but something like that will be easy. And then on this side, instead of looking for the string return, I'll just be looking for, you know, a hash that looks like that, or I'll be looking for, you know, uh, you, you can actually just give the class here and say like, I'm, you know, I'm looking for an instance of the return class or whatever. Um, so that would be super easy. And because there's no static type system, I sort of don't really need to concern myself about like, well, what is the, I don't have to have a coherent type for this, or at least a simple type for this expression. You know, I can just say that it's a sort of heterogeneous collection of bits of S expression and bits of abstract syntax. And then I can gradually cut over where if I, if essentially if I port each of these cases here over to the AST parser and get it to produce a data structure that can be recognized and consumed in this piece of code here, um, then I'm hoping I can, again, sort of hand over hand, just move everything over to using an AST while not breaking any of the tests, you know, some sort of replacing the wheels of the car while it's driving or whatever the appropriate metaphor is there. Um, so yeah, that's what that is. Um, and then, yeah, the final thing here is here I've said versus threading rest through everything. So this is this is like an optional step, but I think I put it on here because I think this is something I want to make sure I at least remember to try to do, which is that because this evaluate function sort of is evaluating a list of expressions, it has to sort of sit in this loop where it's pulling an instruction off of the front of this list of instructions, which is what an expression is. And then it has to keep track of like the rest of that expression. Um, and it means that all of these things here have to, all the way through here, you can see we're doing a lot of sort of admin to make sure that we hold on to the rest of the expression as we work with it. And so it means that it has to be threaded through all of these places. And in the case of this consume structured instruction, it has to be returned as a result to make sure, I mean, is there for the evaluate? Yeah, evaluate numeric instruction has to do this as well. So there's just, it's not a huge deal, but it's a bit of a pain to be having to constantly track this, what what are the unexecuted instructions? Um, and I think it was justified here because, why do I think it's justified? I suppose because there's control flow you can't really, so, so the alternative is that when we're done with one of these instructions, we just throw it away. We just pop it off or I guess shift it off the front of the array and mutate this expression so that that instruction is now gone forever. And I think the problem with doing that is because, is that we've got loops and stuff. Um, and maybe it is just loops actually, but because we've got branches and loops, we need to be able to repeatedly evaluate instructions. And I couldn't quite convince myself. I mean, to be honest, I didn't think about it that hard. Maybe it would be absolutely fine, but it just felt like it could be a source of problems to be, while you're evaluating this S expression, you're also sort of incrementally destroying it. Um, it felt a little bit risky to me. Whereas if you look at how the S expression parser works, this just takes a string. Um, and effectively, it consumes that string. I mean, it doesn't, I mean, this doesn't make any difference in this case. It doesn't actually destroy the string object, but what it does is sort of, as we read regular expressions in the string, we update this attribute to just point at the rest of the string. So while this isn't actually destroying the input, it is at least forgetting it. Um, no one's holding onto it anymore. And so I think if I could do something similar, once once I've got a parser, parsing is only going to happen once. Like the the thing that is being evaluated probably needs to be left alone and not mutated during execution, unless I think about it carefully, which I haven't done. Um, but whatever, if the parser is consuming an S expression, 
I think it's totally fine for it to essentially destroy that S expression as it turns it into abstract syntax. And if I do that, it'll mean that I don't have to do all of this threading of rest everywhere. I can just say, instead of saying while expression in instruction comma rest, I can say something like, you know, until expression is empty, um, instruction equals expression dot shift or something like that. And then this splat rest has gone away because now I've just consumed an instruction from the beginning of the expression and I don't need to track the rest of it because that is just what is left in this expression um, variable. So I think doing these changes, in addition to simplifying the logic here, it's going to give me the opportunity to actually make the that first stage make it a bit simpler by allowing it to mutate the data structure it's been given, which up until now I haven't allowed it to do. So that's my plan of action. Um, I'll stop talking and start coding, although I'm going to, I'm afraid I'm also going to talk while I code. Um, is there any other silly, let's tidy up the pipe spacing in long patterns. Um, where do I have pipe spacing problems? Oh, yes. Look. So I'm just going to try and squash some of these. Um, some of these pedantic. Um, sorry, the next one's Kevin's. This, I, I don't. I didn't mean to call you pedantic, Kevin. Um, I just wanted to squash a couple of these. Uh, I think that was. I think that was it. I, I think I'm, I must have noticed that a while ago. Um, I never came back and cleaned it up, but um, um, fix spacing in alternative pattern. Is that what it's called? Yeah. Um, numeric operation regex. I think, yeah, Kevin noted that this should probably be called new. Well, I can't remember exactly how he put it, but he was he was encouraging me to name this method to match this regular expression. And for some reason, I felt pretty adamant that this should be called evaluate numeric instruction, which really raises the question of why this is called numeric operation. Um, is that right? Yeah, I mean, it's we really don't have a name for this thing, but we don't have a name for this thing that's like the the first bit of an instruction, you know, the name of the instruction. Um, but I think this will be um, better than nothing. Uh, rename numeric operation regexp to numeric instruction regexp. Um, it's still not quite the right name, but it's probably a bit closer to being right. At least now it matches the name of the method it guards. Okay, dealt with that. Uh, arrow not in. So, sorry, I didn't explicitly say this. But what I'm going to do is is do a bit of cleanup first. Uh, try and squash some of these. Um, in particular, some of these are pieces that I want to that I'm going to want to pull out into the AST parser. So I sort of want to make sure they've I've cleaned them up basically, so that they're so that they're good to go. Uh, hash rocket not in for regular expression match in evaluate numeric instruction. Uh, what's that about? Oh, look, yes. So this used to be the condition, instruction match in blah, used to be the condition that guarded this chunk of code before it was extracted into its own method. But now that it's been extracted, um, the condition has just become match question mark again, as suggested by Kevin, because uh, we don't need to capture all of the pieces of it. We just need to call into it. 
Um, but as a result, that means that because matching this regular expression is a, a precondition of being able to call this method in the first place, we no longer want this to be optional. This should be, this is like a mandatory pattern match. Um, and it should raise an exception if it doesn't succeed. Um, I haven't run the test in a while, have I? But what? <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Good job that I had the idea of running the test just then because I had missed that occurrence. Um, okay, fine. All right, so now and I just need to make that change again. Okay. Okay, is that I'll give the tests a chance to actually run because I don't know if there's some weird edge case in which that was failing, but it's looking fairly healthy. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Um uh make a numeric instruction regex match mandatory in evaluate numeric instruction um this line of code was originally a condition that we were using to decide whether to treat the instruction as numeric but now it's inside a method which only gets called in that case so we shouldn't allow the match to be optional anymore okay um deal with nullable values so i think this is about uh unfold so this is about the fact that label and type are optional here so they can be nil um, and also alternative can be nil here. So basically anywhere we have an in uh, here, these two ins and this in could not succeed, in which case label and type and alternative will all be nil, will each be nil if, if any of those fail. Um, I sort of bodged it in by making this label and type thing here and then splatting it, but I think when I looked back on this code, I found that rather unsatisfying. Um, not least because the only reason this is possible is because these two values happen to be adjacent here, um, but that's not necessarily a given. And what I'd like to do is to find a way to write things like this that I can use everywhere. So I think what I'd like to do with this is rather than put these in a local variable and then splat it, I would rather just put them in Essentially, what I want to do is sort of establish a convention here and say, like, look, when there's nillable stuff, just put it in here and then and then call compact on the whole thing so that whether these are adjacent or not, we just sort of, if there's anything inside here that's nillable, then we sort of allow them to be accumulated into this array and then there's just a final call to compact to throw away the, the nil values there. Um, similarly, I think if I... Well, so, so I need to do the same thing here. Uh, compact. And then I think with this, I think that makes this easier now as well, because previously I was sort of jumping through syntactic hoops here to make it possible, f to make it so that this always returns an array, basically. Um, well... Is that what I mean? I suppose what I mean is make it so that we could always call flat map on something. Um, but actually, I think it's totally fine. I think I'm right that we can splat nil. Um, yeah, so 
I think, and I think the reason that works is that nil to a is actually just the empty array. So, uh, you know, this is sort of leaning into some of the th things that are slightly less nice about Ruby, I suppose, in like, like nils do get all over the place. But I think here, I might as well take advantage of it and say like, we don't need this, we don't need an empty array here. We just need to make this safe navigation. Um, so actually, it's nothing to do with this compact, I realize. It's just, if I, if this is nil, then I can splat the nil and get, uh, get an empty array. Is that okay? Yes, because then that will be splatted, yes. If it's like, else, um, splat, nil, end then that's just nothing you know it, it goes away entirely because that's the same as saying i want to insert the empty array at this point so i think that gives me exactly what i want and i think that's a little bit again a little bit neater um you know i can imagine people getting angry about that but tough luck i think i think that's an improvement over what i had before um so assuming I haven't broken anything, which I don't think I have. Um, I think that was a simple enough change. And so I think it was worth, it was worth making. Um, yeah, pending test fails successfully. I have to teach myself to, you know, ignore the, teach myself to ignore those uh, errors that come from the, that come from the pending test. Um, so these two shared that label and type thing, didn't they? Yeah. Um, so I'll just say, uh, what's the right way to say this? Deal with nillable array elements more neatly in unfold. Is that okay? Um, why didn't I just, why didn't I just splat these? Oh, I suppose type can be an array, can't it? I'm tr I was trying to think like what do I write in the commit message about like why I've chosen to do things in this way and I think it's because I, I want to have a general treatment for arrays that could be nil or individual things that could be nil and here the individual thing that could be nil could also legitimately be an array and I don't want to because another way rather than using com compact compact I could just splat these um and then if they're nil, they'll sort of evaporate in the same way that uh, alternative evaporates down here. But this splatted type won't do because that actually legitimately is an array. So I don't want to mess with it in that way. Um, let's just say uh, I'm trying here to introduce a standard way of dealing with potentially nil atom of uh, uh, instructions and arrays of instructions well and sequences of instructions um, uh, compact for the former and safe navigation for the latter these uh, What do I want to say? Um, these are safe to use even when the mm, I think I'll just say this avoids coming up with ad hoc solutions uh, like label and type for every situation. 
which I'm hoping will make the code easier to understand in aggregate. Okay, well, whatever. Yeah, so that's what I said here, safe navigation and compact. Okay. Um, yeah, so a small point that I noticed when I was reading through this code is that expression here, an expression is an array of instructions. Um, and then we deal with all of these different kinds of arrays of instructions. And then this one sort of covers off all other arrays of instructions are covered off by this one. Um, and this case down here is actually really not used, except it makes it easy for us to do this flat map everywhere. So this is what happens if it wasn't an array in the first place. If we just, if we were just passed in a single atom from the S expression, then it will just fall through to here and return it unchanged. Um, but in all of the contexts where unfold is being used, he says, yeah, it's being, the assumption is that it's going to return an array of argument, uh, of, of instructions. So like here, for example, you know, evaluate takes an expression, an array of instructions. Um, and here, you know, flat map is expecting those to be arrays and stuff like that. Now, so that means that this return value is not really correct. Like what I should be doing here is just returning this in an array so that the return type of unfold here is always just an array of instructions. And if you, if as a result of one of these sort of um, indiscriminate flat maps, we end up mapping over some individual atoms, they'll just pass through this unchanged. But I think it's probably good for us to return an array here. I mean, every, Ruby is so tolerant that it's not complaining in places where we're not actually returning an array. Like if, if in Ruby you try to flat map, you, you know, one, two, three, four, and then something that's not even an array. Um, uh, let's just, you know, make it the identity it doesn't complain about the fact that it was trying to flatten this thing that's not even an array with these other things. It just sort of does it. Um, but I think it's less confusing to be able to say this unfold operation takes an expression and it returns an expression. You know, it returns an array of instructions and it takes an array of instructions. I mean, I assume that this case is still actually being, being used. Let me just double check that, but I'd be amazed if... Wow. Oh no, there you go. Wow, we got a really, really long way. Um, but yeah, undefined method match for nil. I'm not sure exactly why that is the problem that it's caused. Um, assuming, of course, that this problem wasn't caused by my previous change. Oh, crap, it was. Oh, I guess because I removed that compact. What a silly person I am. Okay, so let me actually... Let me just see what happens if I take that out. Because I was expecting that to fail, but somewhat suspiciously, it didn't. So maybe we don't actually need that case anymore. Maybe that's in the same category as when we were just mapping over a complete array. Um, well, no, there we go. In unfold f64.const. Yeah, so I guess... It's sort of interesting because I think the reason why this is happening is that we're calling unfold on things that aren't folded expressions. So let me bring a browser up. Uh, I think if we look at uh, float expres, 
the body of Tau is not a folded expression. It's already been unfolded, and you can see syntactically that it's not folded because it doesn't have any brackets around it. So really, we shouldn't be calling unfold on it anyway. But what we're doing is iterating over. <laughs> um, yeah, do I care about this? Sorry, I know this is getting a bit esoteric, but I want to try and get the details of this right. Um, when we invoke a function, what we do is we map over, we sort of assume that the body is multiple folded expressions because it normally is. Well, in this case, it's just one. But like the body is one or more folded expressions in gen in in the common case, which I guess is what I was thinking about when I wrote this. Like that calculate, I remember that calculate function is a good example of that. So you can see here there are seven expressions seven seven folded instructions in this overall expression that constitutes the body so in general what we're doing is mapping over those seven folded expressions and unfolding them now the problem is that for tau if you iterate over everything that's in the body and try to unfold it you're going to be trying to unfold f64.const and then you're going to be trying to unfold zero and then you're going to be trying to unfold local.set so i'm really not doing the right thing here um but for now i think that feels like something that i can come back to i'm going to put it on my to-do list um for now i think just having this return an expression is a step in the right direction. Uh, maybe I'll put a to do on this. To do remove once we stop trying to unfold. Uh, I'll just put to do remove so that I remember that that shouldn't be there. Okay, so that's that hasn't broken anything. Um, so I'm going to check this and then I'm, I'm just going to add another one here and say, and I'm going to pump this to a later stream. I'm not going to try and fix this now. I'm going to say uh, only call unfold on folded <laughs> expressions. Um, if possible, right now we're doing it indiscriminately on function bodies. Uh, regardless of whether the instructions are folded or not. Um, but what about unfolded instructions that appear inside folded ones? Maybe unfolded does, maybe unfold does need to be the thing that distinguishes between these two cases at every level of recursion. So I'm, as I'm thinking about that, I'm kind of talking myself out of it, that maybe, uh, uh, remove else expression from unfold. this happens so I'm, I'm a little bit less confident that it's possible to that it's desirable to make that change because it's one thing to complain about mapping over these at the top level of the function but I think these unflattened instruction sequences can appear anywhere I think I don't think that you have to I'm going to look in text format, folded instructions. So it says a folded instruction can appear anywhere a regular instruction can, but is the converse true? Yeah, I mean, in, you know, inside a folded block, the instructions inside here may well be unfolded. 
So, yeah, anyway, I'll look at this later. But actually, I think maybe it's not just at the top level of functions. It's sort of at every level we have to be able to tolerate the fact that something has to check to see whether this is even something that can be unfolded or not. And essentially, that's what this else is doing. You can call unfold indiscriminately with something that may not even be a folded instruction. And if it isn't, then this is just going to leave it alone. But because the intention is that this function always returns, well, it may return multiple instructions, it always returns an array. And so I think it's correct. This has been an incredible amount of talking for just adding two square brackets around something, but I just wanted to help myself to understand what the right thing to do is here. But let's just say always return uh, a sequence of instructions from unfold. Uh, and let's just say the else case is here so that we can deal with non-folded instructions appearing anywhere that a folded instruction might. We just allow it to pass through unchanged. But because unfold can in general return multiple instructions as a result of the unfolding process, it's more consistent to make sure that we wrap the single instruction in an array before returning it so that the caller doesn't need to deal with uh, a mixture of individual instructions and arrays of instructions. This isn't a big deal in practice because Ruby's operations, e.g. array flat map, are pretty forgiving on this point. So it's really the principle of the thing. Okay. I think that's an adequate explanation of why I made that completely pointless change. Okay. Um, okay, well, uh, maybe that was a little bit of a um, displacement activity because I'm a little bit uh, nervous about this one. Um, so my motivation for this thing was that I felt very uncomfortable about the fact that the consume structured ex instruction function. So the job of this is to basically find, is to read uh, an instruction that can contain nesting. So after the instructions have been unfolded, um, if we if we encounter one of these three things, so either block and then sometime later an end, loop and then sometime later an end, or if and sometime later an end. We need something that's able to find, if I want to read in this whole if or read in this whole loop, I need a method that is able to do that, that is able to read things until it finds the end. But crucially, these instructions inside here might themselves contain a nested block or a loop or an if. So it needs to be, or I have implemented it as, a recursive function that is able to use the Ruby call stack to keep track of how many levels deep am I in that nesting. And then every time it finds an end, it sort of returns and pops off the stack. And so we're sort of counting how many block instructions we found as we dive into the instructions here and then we don't actually stop until we've found the one the end that matches the opening block or loop or if um, so this function does that um, but I've also got this split on else that is sort of more or less a copy of that logic but designed specifically for if so this is designed to find all of the instructions between if and else and then between else and end. So it's doing it in like two pieces. And it occurred to me, I mean, I, even when I wrote this code, I was very uncomfortable with it. But it occurred to me that when I came back and um, when I came back and looked at this code again, it, I felt even more uncomfortable about the fact that this code is really just copied and pasted from 
consume structured instruction and it made me realize that the reason why I needed to copy it like this is just because I've got end hard coded here like the cha the the difference is that down here we keep going until we find else and then here we keep going well yeah in this case we've already this actually operates on the output of this function so we've already found everything from the if until the end and then we're sort of doing a similar operation on the stuff between these two and then saying well, we want to find the else and the same problem exists because the instructions here might contain a nested if so this else is not necessarily syntactically the first one following this if there might be another one nested inside here if there's a if there's another if inside these instructions so we need to do exactly the same job again which is keep going until you find an else and then here it's instead of saying keep going until you find an end it says keep going until you run out of things because the, the end of the array is you know the last of the instructions in the alternative here so I guess that's two things that bother me one of them is that the code is repeated and the other one is that there's a there's an asymmetry here which seems like it might be significant but I don't think it really is um, so what I would like to do is just generalize this so that it's usable for both of these purposes I don't see why I couldn't just pass in end as an argument here and it will consume things until it finds end um, and then when we're parsing the body of an else instead of well I guess we don't need to read all the way up until the end and then do some other operation on it we can just twice say read in everything until you found else and then read in everything until you found end and as long as we're able to provide this as a parameter we can just use consume structured instruction for everything. We don't need to have this. Um, we don't need to have this situation where I've got basically two copies of the same function and this weird asymmetry that's to do with the fact that it's already the input to the the input to split on else has been pre extracted from between if and end. Um, so again, I'm sorry that was kind of a long winded explanation. But what I, yeah, what I want to do is be able to use be able to delete split on else is my goal, and if I can delete it then I'll, that's much less code for me to think about moving over into the AST parser, basically. Um, so that's what I'm going to do. Uh, I haven't really thought about what's involved in this, but I think the, the first thing to do is to add that parameter. I mean, here I suggested it could be called terminated by. I'm not sure that's a very good... Did I do something like this in the S expression parser? Oh yeah, that is actually what I called it, terminated by. I guess that's why that was in my brain. All right, I'll call it that for now. I don't think that's a particularly good. I'm just trying to think of any other names that aren't. I think the reason I chose terminated by is because it's not a Ruby keyword. You know, the temptation is to use it, say something like until, um, or, you know, end <laughs> or something. Um, but that's not really allowed unless I do the... Um, that cheeky keyword arguments thing that I did somewhere. Why did I do that? Oh yeah. Unless you want to, you know, here I did size off something in colon and then I had to use quags.fetch. So I could do that here, but I think I've given that I've already innovated the use of terminated by uh, in another piece of code, I guess I'll just carry on like that. Um, so what I'm saying here is that this is I've got to make sure I pin it because this is a pattern match. Um, um, I think this should also be terminated by. There are no other mentions of end inside here, but of course this is a recursive call. Um, hmm, I can see a problem here, but I'm just going to, so what I'm going to, the problem is that up here, the assumption is that we are, the first thing that we read is going to be one of these, oh no, maybe that's okay.
No, this is going to be a problem for when we're reading the second part of the if, because the second part of it doesn't start with block or loop or if, it starts with else. And that's exactly why, you know, I was sort of hesitating. It's like, why do I need to specify, you know, can I just do terminated by and then use whatever the argument is here? And the answer is, well, no, not really, because... Because I might be calling this in a context where terminated by is else. Like if I was calling if here, like if I was calling this for if, then terminated by would be else. Um, but if I find a recursive block or loop or if here, I really just want to read it up until end. Um, because we're not dealing with the structure of that that instruction yet. We'll get to it later when we come to execute it. But for now, we just want to sort of skip over it, basically. Um, anyway, yeah, sorry, that's... Uh, my brain has slightly snagged on the fact that we're expecting to read this instruction at the beginning. Um, I think maybe we should change that. But for now, I'm just trying to... I just want to add this. I just want to add this argument and have everything work. So I think that's all of the recursive business taken care of. But now we need to find... Um, So terminated by end. Yeah, I mean, I haven't changed the behavior of the function at all. So it's just a question of fixing up all of the call sites. Okay. So this is by no means the whole change. This is just kind of laying the groundwork, right? are passing great um, and terminated by parameter to consume structured instruction again not a very meaningful commit message because that's just you can tell that from the diff well I guess it's easier to tell it from what I'm saying here. Um, this doesn't change the behavior of the method at the moment, but hopefully gets us closer to being able to use it to separately extract both parts of uh, if the first part being terminated by else rather than end. Yeah, I think that's that actually is an explanation of why I made that change. Um, so I, I feel like I just need to re-familiarize myself with what this does. So this reads e.g. block. Like this, I'll just use block as an example. Um, so here it expects the expression passed in to contain that initial keyword um, and then it reads in uh, then all instructions until the matching end returns e.g. block so that gets added on then all the matching instructions and then here we do whatever the terminator was Right. I mean, this feels like a pretty arbitrary decision. Like, it could just as well return only the stuff, only the filling in the sandwich, right? Like, I could do this either way. Let me think about what I would actually need. Split on else. So I suppose what I'm imagining here is that I only do this consume structured instruction. 
you know, only do this for block and loop. And then uh, for if I want to do something like consume structured instruction expression terminated by else and then I want to do consume structured instruction expression terminated by end. But what are the details of what I'm expecting to get out of that? Um, Cause yeah, at the moment we get, uh, you can see sort of pointlessly actually, like I don't need either of them. In fact, I'm having to pad out this pattern match to put the instruction at the beginning so that it so that neither the instruction at the beginning nor the end at the end get included in this splat instructions like clearly that's the bit i actually need and really the opening block or loop or if keyword and the closing end keyword have like been consumed as part of this operation i'm doing um so what would i be getting here I would be getting if uh, consequent else and then here it would be yeah this isn't right it's assuming that the very first thing that it's gonna read like it reads the very first thing, assuming it's going to be block or loop or if, and then it just sort of splats that onto the result um, without looking at it really. But in this case, the else has already been consumed. And so the very first thing, I mean, basically this whole thing is going to be the alternative terminated by end. And I think that will work, but it's just not right because the, there's nothing to say that the very first thing in the alternative won't be another structured expression, structured instruction. So for it to just be skipping over that first thing because it assumes it's, you know, one of the, one of the bits of bread in the sandwich that it's not interested in because it, it, it's that primary loop is about reading the filling of the sandwich. Um, is wrong because in this case there is no this is an open sandwich <laughs> there is no this doesn't begin with any token that says i mean unless i sp unless i push it back on i suppose like i could fake it by pushing that else back on but and that still won't work here because this is expecting to get block loop and loop and if at the beginning so there's something like fundamentally wrong with the way this thing works. Um, and I would suggest actually that we already saw that there's something fundamentally wrong because it's sort of returning something unhelpful here. <laughs> like the whole purpose of this method is to give me these instructions inside the body of the loop or inside the body of the block and that I'm not getting that here. Um, and I'm having to unwrap it myself. So I think what I'm gonna do, let me just stash that. I think what I'm gonna do is change the behavior of this method so that it doesn't include the outside of the sandwich. So I think what that means is we don't do this so we, we we assume that we're being called with you know assume called with xxx in block xxx end um if xxx else Uh, no, that's not right. Uh, 
I think what I'm saying is that we assume that we're being called without the bit at the beginning. That like whoever has decided to call this has already i.e. no leading block loop if whoever has called us has already decided that it wants to read the body of a block or it wants to read the body of an if and that's what's going to allow it to pass in the correct value for terminated by so it's already read that and it's our job to read up until we find the thing that terminates it whether it's end or else um return xxx i think so i think symmetry would dictate that if we're not gonna so we don't pull the instruction off the front here we don't push the instruction onto the result i think it would be weird and asymmetric if we included the end so i think this thing where we add the terminated by should also go away so that that makes it much neater in that we are just operating on the We're just operating on the what goes inside. And then it's the caller's job to deal with the beginning of the sandwich and the, the terminator, whether it's end or else or whatever. And like, we're not doing that. I think that makes more sense. And then we can, that's what we want when we hit that else in the middle because we can throw it away. It won't have been, It's it, it will neither have been consumed by our first call, nor is it expected by our second call. So we can read out just the consequent, then we can throw the else away, and then we can read out just the alternative, and then we can throw the end away. So I think that's what we want to do here. And, you know, it hasn't escaped my notice that we're basically just parsing here. Like, this is just a parser. This is nothing to do with evaluating the expression. But and that's why I wanted to get my house in order before we extract this into the AST parser because I, well, I mean, arguably, maybe I should have done it afterwards. I don't know. I don't know. I just knew that there was a problem here and I didn't want to do any work to, if I was going to be porting stuff over, I don't want to port stuff that I know is wrong. I want to get it right to make less of it and then there's less stuff for me to port over. That's the that's the slightly tenuous logic behind doing this, but it does feel weird to be working on this stuff that is a parser in the wrong, in the wrong place. Um, so, okay, hold on, I've got to think about this. So that's, that's quite an easy change to make. Oh, except this, this thing populated this rest. Like now rest isn't going to be defined. So let's just, for now, let me shim that by saying rest equals expression. And, and the reason I'm doing that is because I can see there's, an, there's already a local variable called expression here. So I'll just shim that in and then I'll come back later and make a decision about what this, what this should actually be called. Maybe what I should do is just replace rest with expression and give this thing a different name, but I'll, I'll think about that in a sec. Um, Naming things is the easy part, isn't it? Everyone knows that. Um, so I think that's the correct change to the outside of this method, but it hasn't escaped my attention that there's a recursive call here. Um, so how do I make sure I satisfy the contract here? I have to, before I pass in rest here, I have to pop off whatever I matched Oh, look, but I can just do this. So if I do that, then that's going to... I mean, that's nicer anyway, right? Like, this match is consuming that keyword. Oh, except I guess I need to... Here, I am the caller. And so if I'm only going to get the filling of the sandwich, then these instructions I'm returning here, I need to make sure that I include this one. Like that needs to uh, let me splat that. 
that instruction needs to be part of what I return. Because remember, the job of this method is basically to just return everything that it finds. So here, if I've recursively consumed the body of a block or a loop or... Yeah, e even an if, actually. Um... Because like I said, we're not actually trying to execute this yet. So I'm not, I'm not bothered about splitting up that. That's a nested if. I'm not worried about splitting it up into its consequent and its alternative. I just want to find the matching end so that I can skip over it. So assuming I've found the matching end, I need to make sure that in my list of instructions I'm returning, I include the instruction that we're skipping over, the body of it, which perhaps would be a better name than split expression here. And then... I guess the end? Just hesitating there, because that feels a little bit gross. Where can I get that from? I think that is the first element of rest here because this expression will be not including the block or the loop or the if keyword it'll be everything up until but not including whatever the terminated by is so i think the first element of this is going to be you know the terminator <laughs> And then there's going to be the actual rest. I don't want to call this terminated by because that's the same as... I'm not sure. I'm not sure what a good name for this is. I mean, maybe putting a literal end there is fine. But I feel like this is maybe more... This is maybe neater. Yeah, I mean, I'd ra ideally, I'd rather only have the magic value in one place. I'd rather not have more than one of them if I need it. And this way, by, by pulling it out of the place where I know, you know, that must be whatever atom terminated this consume structured instruction. So by pulling it out there, I can kind of make sure that this, these instructions I'm assembling here have all come from the input. So this one came from the input here, and then all of these came from the impact input in those places, and so I'm, I'm sort of conserving energy or something. I don't know. It doesn't make sense. There's no. If there was, if there was a linear type system here, then I would have to show that I was using all of these values properly. But as it is, I'm, I'm just running one in my brain unnecessarily. Um, anyway, that feels more correct. Um, is this the same? Yes, that's unaffected by that change in semantics, I think. Um, okay, so problem is I can't run the test to check this because I know that there are more callers than that. Well, I mean, I guess I can run them. But they're going to fail because all of the callers' assumptions are being violated. Yeah, okay. Fair enough. I don't know exactly why that's failing, but it doesn't surprise me that it is. Um, so let's look at the callers. So here... So this is being called with... What's expression here? Right, okay, so we... So expression is the whole remaining sequence of instructions. And then we match out the first one and call it instruction, and then everything else is splat rest. Um, but then here, having matched the instruction and effectively consumed it by matching it, we're now passing in includes that instruction. So I think my new contract is that we don't do that. We just pass in, pass in the rest to everything after the instruction we pass in now. Terminated by end. So we don't need to match for the starting instruction anymore. 
because that wasn't even part of what we were passing in and we and now we don't get it back anymore um we're also not going to get the we're also not going to get the terminator back um although i guess again we're in this that doesn't need to be splattered at all that is literally just the instructions um But I guess we're going to get the... It's the same deal here, right? We're going to get the Terminator. And then we're going to get the rest. And then... But here I don't actually need to do anything with it, do I? I mean, is it more useful here to actually show that? Uh, I'm not sure. Maybe it's better to just... You know, I don't want that end to be part of rest because I've I've dealt with it now. So this is a little bit... This is a little bit inelegant now because I'm having to... I mean, arguably, it's less inelegant than what I had here before, which was having to match you know, having to pin the instruction here and like, it was, I mean, admittedly I could have just had underscores on both sides there. Um, oh, what do I think? I don't have any real justification for this, but I think I'm going to leave it. Why, why do I think, why did I think it was a good idea to have this I don't really understand my reasoning there um, I'm just what I'm trying to think about is when I come back to this code I'm actually gonna be able to understand what's happening I think what I'm gonna do is this is the best of both worlds here so this is saying that this avoids me having to write... So so this asserts that the Terminator we were looking for does indeed begin the rest of, the rest of what's visible here. Um, and then by matching it into a variable here, we don't need to repeat it a third time. So that's kind of an improvement. And then here, it's just acting as an assertion. So at some point, I should... All of these magic strings should be extracted into you know, into constants or something. But I think for now, having having this act as an assertion that just double checks that my code hasn't gone wonky and that this this list of instructions here is indeed followed by end, I think is um, sort of useful. And then we're sort of stripping that off uh, rest there. I think that's okay. Uh, we've dealt with that caller. So what about this caller? Oh, so this is all the same business again, isn't it? Like, this is the whole point, is that the, the body of... This body here is just the same as this this body here. The only difference is in the loop condition. You know, here it's looking for else, and here it's looking for empty loop, but I think the... Uh, empty array. But I think the contents of the loop is the same. Um, well, hold on, let me... Let me comment this out. What is actually different here? Uh, oh yeah, we're concatenating onto consequent, not instructions. Um, oh, and also it's not called rest here, it's called instructions. Oh, what a mess. Okay, well, I'll just... For now, I'll just do that replacement. The whole point is to delete this method, so I'm not going to spend any time tidying it up because I'm hoping it's going to go away soon. Um, so for now, I'll just hold my nose and live with the fact that it's a bit gross. Um, and then here... I think it's exactly the same code again, but now instead of the consequent, it's the alternative. 
yeah, I'm really looking forward to throwing this code away. So I think that's it. Um, I think float expras is the litmus of this stuff. Consume structure. Okay, well, that's wrong. Why has that gone wrong? Okay, it was fine before. I suppose I don't actually know where the problem is. I'm sort of eyeing this suspiciously, but it's not necessarily this, is it? It could be, it could be anywhere. Um, let me just look at the diff and think about it. That sort of seem okay, doesn't it? Uh, I'm not sure why this isn't working. Rest. Instructions. That all looks, it all looks like what I intended it to look like. Um, what's going wrong? Something is the answer. Uh, okay, let's do some puts debugging. Can, uh, well, let's just put the expression. <laughs> so let's just see what it's trying to... Oh, well, that's already wrong. Exit. Hunt. Okay, so something's going wrong there. Um, so let's just have a look at what's happening, how this is bouncing back and forth with evaluation. I'm sure I've just made a silly, this is just going to be a typo or something silly. As I don't think it's going to be a, an essential problem. But So this is saying evaluate block and then label. Oh, hold on. No, 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 no. This is right. This is right. This, this is what I wanted. I wanted it to remove the leading keyword and then say consume everything up until presumably there. Oh, but there's still... Hmm, now that's all okay. Okay, so what have I... What have I forgotten? Um... Let's just say consumed 
Um, um, Pretty print will add those. So here, block up until end. So from the body, it should be consuming. All of that. So from here is recursively trying to consume the whole loop. So it should have consumed all of this up until the first end. Which it appears to have done. So that seems to be doing the right thing. 365 no matching empty array no matching pattern error being called from 314 don't understand what's gone wrong here. Like there's, there's not even an if involved here. So I don't think it's related to split on else. In fact, let me just, let me confirm that. If I raise, if I raise here, yeah. So we're, we, we're not even getting down to this code. So it's definitely not that. It's something to do with the change in contract between this caller and then this implementation. So here we're saying, We're no longer passing in that leading instruction. We're just passing in the rest. And we're not expecting to get back that leading instruction. We're just expecting to get back the body. And then this rest argument here is going to begin with end. That all seems correct to me. So down here, so rest equals expression. That was just to avoid... Oh, so this, I don't want to be doing this. This is reassigning rest to be, hey, welcome. I'm good. How are you doing? Thanks for, thanks for joining the chat. Nice to see you. Um, well, I mean, I'm doing semi okay. I've got a, I've got a bug at the moment, but I think I've just figured out what it is, which is that this used to, this strips the terminator off. And then we used to have a line of code here that was adding it, that was adding it back because it formed part of the body that we were returning. But now I want to leave it in the rest 
Um, but I've here I've reassigned rest to be the array not including that terminator. So I think that's the problem. I think if I if I just make this a check that doesn't modify, that doesn't reassign rest there, so it doesn't actually consume the terminator and it leaves it in that rest array, that I th that sh that's got to be the problem. Ah, unhandled exception on split on else. Right, that's what I want. Uh, where's all my puts is? Okay. Uh, raise. All right, okay. Let's see how we do. Hey, nice. All right, so I'm going to optimistically remove all those puts is in that case. Uh, so I think that that's, oh, let's get rid of this as well. I think that's the change I wanted to make. Um, well, I mean, I'm, I'm not done with this refactoring yet, but this is, I'm trying to make the change easy. This is the make the change easy part. And then soon I'm going to make the easy change, I hope. Um, I don't like this, rest equals expression. But I can't rename rest to expression because it will conflict with this local variable. So why don't I call this... Uh, I don't know what to call it. What do I call it down here? Oh, there I called it expression. <laughs> um... God. Uh, how about I just call it body? That's not a great name, but it's better than nothing, I think. And then, well, I can get rid of this and then make this just problem is that rest is a really good name for it because it shows you okay okay right um i'm just gonna leave it like that for now i can't like i said i'm hoping that i can get rid of rest at some point but until i get rid of it it's really useful to show that that's what you're returning here and i think it makes this easier to understand so maybe i'll just live with the fact that i've i'm assigning that I'm just assigning it. I'm assigning the whole expression. I mean, I could just rename the argument, couldn't I? No, because if and when I do manage to remove rest, I want expression to be the argument to this thing. It will just be mutated. Um... So yeah, I think this is the best of a bad, best of a bad lot. Um, exclude leading and terminating atoms from consume structured instruction. Result. Well, it's and the input as well. Let's just say. Um. This will make it possible for us to reuse it to read the consequent and alternative of an if, which it can't currently do because it will uh, both consume the first time and expect the second time the else. It wouldn't actually expect an else because at the moment it's only designed for bl for block loop and if not else. But that's the nature of the problem that I'm trying to solve here. Um, okay, right. I think I'm ready to make the easy change now. He says. 
So what will that look like? Split on else. Oh, this is a complication. Y you know, if up here, I just, I do what I said I was going to do, which was like, you know, for block and loop, do this. And f for if, do it twice, you know, up to else, and then do it up to end. Um, then these are being read... I mean, actually, this was a this was a sort of a category error all along. Like once we've once we've read the instruction block loop or if the label and the type are not really part of this nested bit. It's only this is this should really be consume nested expression um, or consume. Well, it's it is a cons it is a structured instruction. Cons yeah, <laughs> it's consuming an expression inside a structured instruction, but that's too long as a method name. Um, these really aren't part of that expression. These are a preamble to it. So actually, I don't think I am ready to make the easy change yet, or I can make a different easy change, which is, oh, I've got to be careful about local variables here. Or oh, have I? Yes, because these, at the moment, these are operating on splat instructions, which are what get pulled out of the body. So yeah, this is all in the wrong order. Let's do this before anything else, unconditionally. Yeah, and this, this should be operating on rest. So we unconditionally try to extract the label. So straight after block loop or if, we try to get the label and then we try to get, well, in, uh, here we're just ignoring the type. At some point we're going to need to hold on to that, but right now it's just being thrown away. And then, well, let me just check that that hasn't broken anything. It shouldn't have done. It shouldn't matter whether we, for the purposes of our current implementation, it shouldn't matter whether those get read before or after we've, delimited the nested instruction. Um, so I think that will be fine. Uh, again, I should have just checked float expressions because that seems to be the fussy part. But assuming that all works, which I appear to be assuming, oh, Poo, why isn't that working? Evaluate alternative locals. Oh, it's... <laughs> I commented out this line. God damn it. Sorry. Okay, look. If that works, then I'm going to I'm gonna move on. I'll, I'll run the tests again at the end, but I think... That's just a simple... That's a simple reordering of code and I think I believe that those operations commute with each other because it doesn't matter whether you first find the body of the st structured instruction and then you pull the label and the type off the front of it or vice versa like it the order of those operations doesn't matter and I think the fact that that test is passing is enough I could have I could have run all the tests in the time it's taken me to justify that but whatever um <sighs> So this is something like um, handle structured instruction label and type before consuming its body. Um, it doesn't matter what order we do these in, but it's much easier to treat if differently from block loop if we just deal with the label and type first. In practice, it doesn't matter what order we do these in. In principle, we were doing them in the 
wrong order before and are doing them in the right order now. So that's a philosophical improvement in addition to the practical one. Okay. So now I can do what, what I was talking about, which is... Well, I was actually going to put a... I was going to put a conditional here, case instruction in block or loop. But actually, I'm, I'm about to do that anyway. So I think maybe I'm just going to duplicate this into the block and the loop arm of this conditional. Um, well, I suppose this is a commit, isn't it? To, to push that into all three arms of that case. Um, again, let's just check that I haven't broken anything. Okay. Uh, push consume structured instruction call into each case, uh, each block loop if case. Um, I'm trying to make this different for if, but first I need to create the place where I can make that change. Uh, repetition of make there. I think that's okay. All right. Um, so now I can finally do what I want to do, which is basically at last get rid of this split on uh, else and just be able to directly consume the consequent and the alternative. So I think what that's going to look like is... Here, this instructions is going to be consequent. And here, this is going to be alternative. And this is going to be terminated by else. And this is going to be terminated by end. So I think that's... Hold on, what's... <sighs> so instructions... I think that's okay. And then we pop the stack. I think that's okay. And then we leave rest over to be picked up down there. I mean, I think that's right. Let's see. Yeah, that seems okay, doesn't it? So I think I can say consume consequent and alternative directly for if. Um, we now have a flexible enough implementation of consume structured instruction of the consume structured instruction method that we can reuse it here instead of having a whole separate 
method for sp for splitting the body on else. Um, it's going to be easier to understand and maintain this code if we're not duplicating the same logic three times with minor changes. So now, of course, the purpose of doing all this was so I could just delete this flipping method. So, so this is uh, delete unused split on else method. Uh, let's run all of the tests. Well, let's just check this. Yes. Okay, well, if this all passes, then I think we can call that a success. I mean, it's still not completely, you know, don't repeat yourself, but I think it's a lot closer to being correct now. I mean, basically, we've got three different implementations here, but they share this handling at the, at the, at the top. Okay. Yeah, I'm still having to remind myself that that failure is expected. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, done. All right. <laughs> Two hours in, uh, I'm ready to get started on the thing that I said I was going to do, which was introduce an AST. But I think it's going to be less painful now that I've now that I've dealt with that debt before I start doing any of the extractions, because the idea of having to deal with any more code than is strictly necessary as part of this gives me the willies. Okay, I'm glad I wrote this to-do list because I sort of forgotten what was um, what was involved in this. Um, so I want to hook up the dummy unfold and parse expression. So that makes sense. I think I think what I was imagining here, let's make an AST parser.rb. I was imagining well something similar. Let's say the same API as the S expression parser, right? You can create this and then you call parse in this case you call it with a string and you get back an s expression i think here you should be able to call this with parse and you give it an s expression um and you get i'm just going to ignore the ignore the fact that this parser is uh, returns an enumerator because that's i did that to make the test feel faster but it's not super important i mean maybe i'll want to do the same with this ast parser but let's get the damn thing working first so here this should return an ast so i think for now what i mean by that and maybe this should be yeah i think as like i said i think this should probably be parse expression um but I'm just thinking I want to unfold it first. I want to unfold the whole thing recursively before I try to parse it. So hold on, I'm going to Obviously I can change this later, but just to keep my head straight at the moment, I'm going to have parse I'm going to have unfold and then I'm going to have parse expression. And I think what I really mean by parse expression is like parse unfolded expression. But the idea, the, the, the prospect of having to type that that many times 
gives me the willies. So for now, I'm just going to call this parse expression. So what this is going to do is it's going to unfold the S expression. And then it's going to pass that to parse expression. So this is essentially the same structure as we've got over in the interpreter, which is the uh, in invoke function. We unfold the body. And then we evaluate it. Oh, I'm going to have to think about what this actually looks like, but because of this whole business about oh God, this whole business about flat mapping and all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, I think I'm not going to worry about that for now. I'm going to say that because that's really the that problem really belongs to whoever calls it depends on what you call pars with right but let's assume you've called you've called pars with an s expression that you that needs to be unfolded I, i'll have to i can't get my head around this i'll have to if the tests fail i'll have to figure out what the right thing to do is here but for now i'm going to say the job of this thing is to be given a raw s expression that's come out of the s expression parser and then it's going to unfold it and then it's going to parse it now in principle, I could combine those two jobs. Like it could unfold it as it's parsing it. But I think given that I've already got a separate unfold function that works correctly, I'm at least going to begin by having that be... So I was talking about staging the computation before and having a sort of a parsing stage and then an execution stage. I guess the parsing stage is actually going to be a stage computation as well but in this case I've already got one of them implemented like that's why I'm doing it this way is because I've already got an unfold function so to begin with this is not going to do anything it's just going to return the original s expression um, and then parse expression I guess is also not going to do anything it's just going to return the return the original so both of these are just doing nothing at the moment. But the reason they're doing nothing is so that I can hack them up. Um, so I can hook them up into the, into the interpreter and not break any of the tests. I know I said I was going to think about it later, but I'm really troubled by this flat map situation. I think... If the intention here is to parse an expression, then an expression is an instruction sequence. So if you give me an expression, that is an array consisting of one or more instructions. So I shouldn't try to unfold that. This is, I think, in the same way as it was actively wrong when I was trying to directly unfold the body of the function. I think this is just actively wrong. I think this should be, you've given me an S expression that represents a WebAssembly expression, which is an instruction sequence. And it's possible for each of those instructions to be folded according to this scheme. So I should try to unfold each of the instructions that you've given me here. I think that's right. So this needs to this needs to be our old friend flat map. And then we and then we try to parse it. I think that's right. I think it was just really bothering me that that was different from what I had before. And in that case, I guess I should make this the sort of you know if we're going to be flat mapping, then I should be balancing that out by saying unfold always returns an instruction sequence. Um, and it definitely does because 
it just returns the original expression, a sequence of one thing, which was the expression you gave it. It hasn't done any unfolding, it's just giving it back to you, but it's giving it back to you in a sequence of, of one instruction. Um, so that was a little bit laboured, wasn't it? Um, so now I want to, I guess I have to figure out how to, how to hook that up on the interpreter side. Um, where do I want to plug that in though? Let me see. Where are my options? Like, I've sort of got several entry points into evaluation, so I have to try and find, like, a sensible place to hook it in. Um, if I want to wire it up, I'm going to have to require it. I've got unfold, I've got pause expression. So basically, all of the places, I think this is essentially everywhere I call evaluate. Everywhere I'm trying to, well, all of these top level places where I'm doing evaluate unfold. So for now, this should be AST parser dot new dot parse. Why that's expected dot first, I don't know. That's very strange. Uh, I'll try not to think about it. Um, so here we do arguments dot each. Argument evaluate argument. something else a bit funny here actually because yeah hold on I want to think about this for a second I, I I haven't looked at this since we were able to support instruction sequences let me just do a stash sorry it's just making me realize that this is maybe no longer necessary in as much as What we want to do is evaluate each of these arguments so that they all get pushed onto the stack so that then we can pop them off. But now we can just evaluate an instruction sequence directly. So now that we've got support for evaluating multiple instructions, we don't need to do this in a in an each anymore, we can do something like evaluate arguments with locals, but we just need to make sure that it's correctly unfolded. Um, and yes, I believe that this is, because here we were unfolding each argument, this needs to be a flat map where we unfold each argument so there is still a, there's still an iteration here, but we've moved evaluation outside of this loop. So now I think if I've got five arguments, if I unfold all of them to get, to turn each of them into an instruction sequence and I concatenate all of those instruction sequences and then I have single evaluation of that instruction sequence, I'll end up with all my arguments on the stack. So I think that's, that seems legit. Uh, so that wasn't on my, oh, that wasn't on my list of things to do, but I do think I want to do it. Um, evaluate all arguments 
uh, together in invoke function. Um, I'd missed that we were able to do this once we started supporting instruction sequences versus individual instructions in evaluate. I think it's clearer to execute entire instruction sequences where possible. Okay. Yeah, because that's what I was confused about. I was like, why am I doing that? And the answer is uh, no reason, you know. Path dependence. This is just a historical accident that that was there. Um... I mean, of course, that doesn't really get me any closer to being able to make the change I want to change. Hi, Chris. Welcome. Thanks for joining us. Um, but that is at least another small piece of cleanup that allows me to... Uh, oh, wow. It actually merged it correctly. I was not expecting that. Okay. So what's my diff here? Let's intend to add that parser because I should have... I should have, it, the stash didn't get that before because I hadn't told Git about that file. Um, so this is saying unfold expected dot first. Again, oh, I'm sorry, but again, why is that? Why is that? <laughs> If I'm going to change all of these calls to evaluate, I need to understand what they're doing. Why is this unfolding only the first? I, I think this should just be a minute. Um, okay, fine. All right, I know how to deal with that. It's all, this, this whole thing is a big bodge in here, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to start messing with it now. I think this thing here should be like a, should be an array. We're saying we've got an instruction sequence here, but it's just one instruction. Um... I mean, it really doesn't matter because this is never a... Okay, I'm just going to leave that alone. So whatever it was that we were going to evaluate here... So, okay, I'm going to rethink what I'm trying to do here. Everywhere we were calling evaluate and giving it a sequence of instructions, i.e. an expression, I'm just going to insert... A call to the AST parser inside there. So I'm going to, I feel like I'm overthinking it here. Like all I'm doing is just trying to shim in the AST parser. So it, it's intercepting that S expression as it escapes. Um, and I think partly what's messing me up here is thinking about unfold. But the next thing I'm going to do is just move that over. So, um, I'm not going to get too hung up on it. So I'm just going to do exactly the same thing here. Again, a bit messy. Uh, that unfolds going to go away soon. Um, And same thing here, I suppose. Yeah, I keep trying to think about it and think about what should be going on with Unfold and all of that stuff, but I just need to let it go. Okay, and by the time we get inside Evaluate, so these recursive calls to Evaluate, I'm not worried about because 
at the top level, I will have already have squeezed everything through the AST parser. So by the time we reach all of this stuff, it will already have been transformed. So I think that's... Yeah, I mean, so the adding the identity function has not broken anything is the newsflash there. Um, I don't really need those to-dos in um, AST parser because they're obviously... It's obviously not done. <laughs> really, I I should only leave those around for things that I feel like I'm not going to... You know, things like this. That to-do has been there for weeks now. Um, yeah, these have all been here a while. Um, and I haven't done them yet. Whereas the actual task I'm doing at the moment is this. So I don't need to immortalize that forever in the in the git history really um okay so i think this is like add dummy well create dummy ast parser and hook it up to the interpreter um this doesn't do anything yet, but it gives me a place to start incrementally converting S expressions into an abstract syntax tree. One instruction at a time. Uh, type of instruction at a time. Okay. So now, so hook up dummy, yeah, so that's basically what my commit message said. Extract unfold. So this is like a pretty major bit of surgery that I'm, I want to lift this whole function out, which, as I said, I don't think um, connects to anything else. So in fact, if I if I leave this in place, that just returns its input unchanged, and then we swap that for this. Actually, I see that all of the here it's called expression. In this parser, I'm going to clarify that it's an S expression. Um, So here we're unfolding an S expression, blah, blah, blah. So hopefully that doesn't break anything. Um, so let's say move the uh, contents of, uh, what is this class, interpreter? It's been so long since I even thought about what this class is. It probably needs, well, maybe it's okay now, but it's, this all needs breaking out into separate files and namespaces and stuff. Uh, move the contents of interpreter unfold into ASD parser. Uh, let's say this code is unchanged, except renaming expression to S expression, the expression argument. Um, it just lives in a different place now. And then I think the reason I didn't just remove this is because there's a lot of calls to it. So I wanted to see it work before I removed it. So now all of these places that are calling unfold, I'll just get rid of them. This is what I was advertising before. Um, so it's it's going to get unfolded in the correct way inside ASD parser parse. So I don't need to do that work here. Uh, okay, no more unfoldy. Oh no. 
I've broken something. Ah, I was too enthusiastic with my deleting. <laughs> uh, that is in invoke function. It's very important that we only invoke the function body and not somehow the function because that doesn't make sense. We can You cannot evaluate a function definition. You can only evaluate the body of the function. So that was just a silly typo. A vimo. All right, so uh, that's, um, hold on. Yes, okay, I missed the deletion of the definition. Okay, remove uh, unused interpreter unfold. Um, AST parser unfold does this now. Okay, so that's completed the sort of hand over hand moving of that into here i just wanted to i wanted to briefly say that i think there's a trade-off here which is having this unfolding as like a separate stage is both better and worse a separate phase and it's better in the sense that it just gets to write this nice fairly simple translation from s expression to s expression which is sort of what's implied by this right like this is sort of saying this it is defined this this unfolding this abbreviation is defined on s expressions <laughs> um so in a way this is the most natural way of doing it is i've just written it down in ruby um what the translation here is but the downside the flip side of that trade-off is that it's not actually quite as simple as this because in order to do this properly in order to implement this plain instruction followed by folded instruction you need to know the static arity of every plain instruction so i have to know that all of these something.const operations and local.get and set and t and br if and call all take a single argument and that has to be built into this translation here so that when i reorder these instructions they get you know they end up in the right order you don't want the argument to be moved in front of the instruction because it's not it, it, it shouldn't be evaluated and its value left on the stack. It's like part of the instruction. So it needs to immediately follow it in this in the S expression. So I'm doing some sort of admin overhead there. And I'm just aware of the fact that what I'm going to do when I build the AST is that I'm going to need to, again, I'm going to need to know the static arity of these instructions, right? And so if in this unfold here, if instead of just jamming these things back into an S expression, if here I was saying like, you know, AST node dot new, you know, name is instruction and argument is argument. Um, yeah, that's exactly what I was getting at, Chris, is that in the, it, currently in the evaluator, all of that knowledge of static arity is, is recreated. So yeah, exactly here. Uh, no, sorry, not here. Here, where I'm popping the name off the front of the stream of instructions because I know that they only that those things take one argument and I know that return doesn't take any so that knowledge is all reproduced over here now that problem will go away when I've got abstract syntax because the evaluator is not going to be consuming a sort of a, a flat list of undifferentiated atoms from an s expression it's going to be consuming structured instructions so this is going to be getting a hash or a struct or something that's already got the this name argument inside it so that's fine but i'm just going to be moving that problem over to the the parser here that turns the as that turns the stat the s expression into the ast it is going to have to know this information as well so i just wanted to call out the fact that i suppose what i'm doing is making a conscious decision here which is to 
keep these stages as separate for now because I currently have them working separately, even though there's some duplication there. And part of what I'm trying to do here is reduce the duplication. At the very least, what I'm doing now is isolating that duplication into the AST parser, and it's not going to leak out into the evaluator anymore. I do think there's another improvement to be made here, which I will at least write down now that it occurs to me. Um, but I don't know if I'm going to do it yet, which is to... Well, I guess this is a separate section that's about refactoring AST parser. <laughs> uh, I can't type. I still can't type. Um, which is something like unfold and parse together so that so that the knowledge of the static arity of each instruction only lives in one place or represent the static arity of each instruction in some kind of data structure that both unfold and parse expression can refer to rather than both knowing that information independently and having to keep it in sync, etc. So I think I do need to do one of these two things. I either need to combine the unfolding. I know I haven't even implemented the parser yet, but I'm just, I'm trying to, the reason I'm talking this through is to make sure that I'm not going to paint myself into a corner, but I think I'm not. I think as long as I... My primary goal is to get something working. And then once I've got something working, I need to make a decision. I do need to do one of these two things. I either need to combine them so that the parsing happens in a single operation that, that you know, you can see that this unfolding here could well, you know, it's, it's essentially recognizing what instruction we found and it knows the static arity of it. So there's not really any reason that it couldn't be producing a structured representation of this instruction right now. It's just not. Um, so I either fold them together into a single stage of evaluation or I keep them as separate stages, but I extract the knowledge into a centralized place so that both of those stages are using a lookup table to figure out, you know, it's not just a question of what's the static arity, but we need to find a way to represent knowledge like all these loads and stores have a single optional argument with this syntax. And so if if an atom that looks like offset equals followed by one or more digits immediately follows that instruction, then that is a static argument. But if it's not there, then this instruction doesn't have any arguments. So representing that in a data structure is totally doable. It'll just be a bit annoying. But I think I do need to do one of those two things because otherwise we'll be forever stuck in this situation where there's two copies of the information of the arity of every single instruction. I think as I add more instructions, that's just going to become more and more annoying. So that does need to be done. Um... And I suppose I wanted to talk it through to check that I was comfortable with that. And I think I am. So I'm quite happy to just continue as I am and then just kick the can down the road here and just accept that at the moment, the duplication between unfold and the evaluator, as Chris uh, correctly said, is now going to be reproduced in the parser instead, um, which at least is moving the duplication away from the interpreter, the evaluator, but it doesn't actually um doesn't actually kill it entirely so all right that was a lot of blather okay extract unfold to asd parser unfold incrementally extract parsing parts of evaluate et al to asd parser parse expression right so i think what i had in mind here having moved unfold over there was no point doing this piecemeal because the whole thing could just be air lifted over um but now I think I need to chew my way through some of these. You know, this because this is separated into cases. 
so if I can just get through this a case at a time, um, then I'll be gradually making my way towards having a having an abstract syntax tree being communicated between the parser and the interpreter. So I suppose I just need to make a decision about like where am I going to start? Like what's the what's the best way to begin that process? Um well f I think first I'm going to think about what the skeleton of this is going to be. This parse expression I suppose the shape of this is going to be essentially oh well actually that's not true i was going to say it's going to be essentially the same as this and i think that's true in a way um so this is going to say while s expression in instruction and rest so inside here we'll be able to have I mean, maybe I maybe I won't start with. No, no, I could start with the numeric instructions. Actually, it wasn't my intention, but like that is literally that's syntactically the first thing. So let's let me just sketch out the shape of this. You know, it's gonna be it's gonna be something like this. If blah else, and then we get this. You know, I was gonna put a case in there, but then I realized that it, it's it's not really a case. It's this. Oh, hold on. It is just a case now. Because now that I've switched this to being case instruction rather than case expression, that is what this is matching against. Okay, okay, okay. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I Again, I'd missed that. This can, this can just... I can just promote this to the top. This is much... This is much nicer. Um... Because this can just be another. Uh, that's rather a lot to indent in one go, isn't it? Uh, I think that is the same, and that and that gives me what I what I sort of wanted to write, which is well, each time round this loop, we're just switching on what instruction we're doing. Um, I think that's much better. And it certainly looks like it works. So, okay, let's just make that little tweak. Um, make uh, numeric instruction regex check just another case. Um, this has been available for a while uh, we used to switch on the entire expression here, but once we switch, but once we started switching on instruction, let's make this. Uh, once we started switching on instruction, we could have used the regular expression directly as another case it's much nicer to have the evaluator be one big case statement. Okay, right. That's that's what I was expecting. So the fact that I can actually make it like that is, is very nice. So, yes, this is a slightly less hairy um, reformat now. So this is just you know, I was imagining that it was it's gonna be this. Um but the problem is <laughs> we didn't need to return anything. This evaluate function intentionally doesn't return anything like it's only it's reason for existing is to have side effects on the contents of the stack whereas 
this is very much not like that. This is in fact not going to have any side effects. It's the the whole purpose of Parr's expression is just that, well, actually it probably is going to have the side effects of consuming its input. But in terms of what's the purpose of it, the reason you call it is to get an abstract syntax tree back. So we're going to need some kind of result here that gets returned at the end. Um, and the most obvious, I mean, I haven't really thought about what the what form that AST is going to take, but I think the obvious way to think about this is that what we want to get back, you've given me an expression, which is an instruction sequence, and I'm going to give you back a sequence of richer representations of those instructions. So, I mean, whether this even qualifies as an abstract syntax tree, I don't know. I mean, some of those instructions do have nesting in them, so it sort of does, but I can't think of a good reason to not just use an array here. Maybe I should have a maybe I should have an abstract syntax tree class to represent an expression that contains an array of expressions. But for now, I think just saying we start out with an empty array. We go around this loop, which is sort of the same as the loop in the interpreter. And we're like here, we're sort of popping off. Well, again, uh, this ha this needs to happen recursively for these things you know what at the moment what evaluate numeric instruction does is it has a side effect on the stack and it returns the unevaluated portion of those s expressions um i need to do something with oh i guess in the evaluator at the bottom there's something that updates the value of yeah so I, I mustn't forget this this is part of the i was like how, how does that even work so this is part of the large scale structure is that we once we're done with this then we sort of bump that s expression to say okay we've consumed some instructions now we're ready for the rest and then we go back up to the top here so we don't really need two separate variables here but again just for clarity i think it's easier to think about S expression is what we were given up top and then rest is the stuff that we haven't tried to execute yet and then by the time we've executed or parsed a full instruction which might involve multiple atoms from the S expression then we sort of then there's a checkpoint where it's like okay now our new S expression is what remains after that incremental consumption of possibly many atoms from the S expression um so yeah, what I was trying to say was we start out with an empty result, we go around this loop however many times, and then we return the result at the end. And I think this is probably just like, you know, like whatever comes out of this case, having just outdented it nicely, I'm not going to indent it. You know, every t this is going to yield um, a nice representation of each individual instruction the nature of which is to be determined. <laughs> um, and then we're going to add it to the result and then that's what you're going to get for calling it. And then this loop inside the inside here, inside the evaluator, won't need to be a while loop that tracks rest anymore. This can just be like expression dot each do instruction. And each of these instructions will now be a nice structured instruction that's been produced by the by the AST parser. Um, but we won't be able to actually make that transition until every single thing in here has been chewed up and spat out by the AST parser, which at the moment none of them have been. So we're going to need this in place on both sides as a kind of hand-over-hand -hand maneuver until this thing is complete. So I think I've sort of talked myself around to what I think the structure of this should be um but the, the point i was going to make here is that now we need this to return instead of just return the rest we need this to return um 
you know, a numeric instruction and the rest. So this, when we implement these helper methods, they're going to need to, you know, this parse expression is at the top level and it, it chews away on this S expression until nothing remains. Um, evaluate numeric instruction is going to have to chew off it's going to bite off as much as it can chew of the of the s expression God, i'm gonna have to do um doing a lot of renaming um and then it's going to have to return the rest here so that the next iteration of the loop can pick up where it stopped and this whole thing is my motivation for eventually saying refactor it to destructively consume the s expression rather than threading rest through everything because threading rest through everything is a pain um but again I'm just trying to, I just want to get it working based on the code that currently exists. And then once this is, once the dust is settled, then I'll go through and um, make this improvement so that there's less threading. I mean, could I have done this more easily sooner? No, I talked a bit about why not, because I, I don't feel comfortable modifying the S expression while we're evaluating it because of control flow. Whereas... It, I don't have such qualms about completely destroying this S expression object in the process of parsing it because what else is it going to be used for? Like it, it's it's only it's ephemeral. It only needs to exist for as long as it takes to generate an AST from it. Whereas if you're evaluating the S expression directly, it sort of needs to have a long life. So yeah, we'll sort that out later. So I wonder. Oh God. Is it going to be instructive for me to do the evaluate numeric instruction bit first? You know, and this is actually going to be parse numeric instruction. Or shall I start with something smaller? I think I'm going to start with something smaller because that feels like a big step to me. Let's get something. Ultimately, I want to restore these cases in the same order. But for now, I think I'm going to skip on to something simpler like return. So, I mean, this is, you know, this is the simplest possible thing to start with. I just need to communicate the, the information that we found a complete return instruction here. So I, might, I think my three options are like, I could use hashes, you know, the name, I don't know what we'd call this the name of the instruction is return. And then if it did have any arguments, we could say like, you know, label is whatever, or, you know, static offset is whatever, but this one doesn't have any arguments. Um, so it would just be that. Another option is for me to do essentially the same thing, but to have some kind of class that represents instructions. So, You know, one generic class that, again, like any any keys and values I put in here would just be stored. And then I'd, this would just be a sort of a generic instruction implementation, um, which could just, which might just be a struct with a single field that's, you know, attributes or something. Um, and then I think the third option is for me to have a sort of a per instruction implementation. Where it's like, well, for this one, I'm going to I'm going to return a return object. And for a different instruction, um, you know, for local get, I'm going to return a local get dot new, except this one's going to have to have a, I guess it's a name. That, that means something different from this name. Uh, I think, although I might regret this, I think I'm gonna go with this one. I think, I think there are few enough instructions. I mean, there are quite a lot of different ones, but there are few enough that I think it's not gonna be too onerous to just have a bunch of these constants that name them. And then that presents a few opportunities to you know, I can put those constants in arrays if I want to talk about classes of, you know, all the numeric instructions. I could sort of have all of the class names in an array and say these are the types of instructions that are numeric. Um, I 
I mean, I guess if they're classes, then it creates the at least the possibility that I could start putting some of the implementation on them. I mean, I mean, a, you know, a very common way of implementing a tree walking interpreter is to have like a execute method or whatever, like on the nodes of the AST. So you say like, you know, this return class wouldn't just be a plain struct. It would be a class that has a method on it called execute. And all of the instructions would have a method called execute or evaluate or whatever. And then when you call that, you know, by virtue of polymorphism, you're, you recursively call evaluate on the body of that block or whatever, and it calls the right, it dispatches to the right implementation of the right method on the right class. And like, instead of having a big case statement where you're switching on the type of instruction, you're letting the object-oriented language implementation do the, you're replacing conditional with polymorphism if you, if you do that. I'm not sure if I want to do that yet. I mean, regular exp the um, pattern matching gives me a very nice, you know, it's very easy to just say in local get, and I want to match the name of that thing. If it's a, if this is a, if local get is a class whose instances implement um, deconstruct keys, which struct does. So I could use this syntax for matching individual structs. I think this probably maximizes clarity. Um, or at least it's the smallest change from right now. I, I do need to think separately about once I've got this working, do I want to shift it to being like a more object-oriented style of interpreter where this evaluate function gets exploded out into a million separate pieces that live on all of the different AST node types? Um, I don't know, you know, because of the expression problem, which is to say... Well, let's not get into that. Basically, it's a bit zero sum. You know, either I get one almighty big function here um, and it's really easy to add cases to it. Uh, or I explode it out onto all of those individual um, objects and it's easy to add a new object, but harder to add another function that sort of I feel like my brain's getting the expression problem the wrong way around. I always forget what's supposed to be easy and what's supposed to be hard. Um, anyway, the point is you're just rearranging the furniture. <laughs> That's uh, I shouldn't try to be high-minded about things that I can't even remember the details of. Um, it's always hard to remember what other programmers think is like easy versus difficult. But ultimately, either you group things by operation name which is what I'm doing here or you group things by the sort of the type of the thing you're operating on which is what that would be if I moved evaluate onto all of the individual nodes anyway I'm getting distracted by something that is not yet relevant but I think that's a long-winded way of saying I want to do this I think I want to yeah I think I want to do that and I, I realize I'm signing myself up to define a bunch of these uh, classes, but that's fine. Why don't I make an ast.rb? Well, there'll be a module. Let's require it in here. And let's put a return equals struct new. And actually I have to put nil in here, I think. Yeah, that's slightly annoying. I mean, really, there's no point making it a struct. It could just be object on new. But then I have to remember which ones I can instantiate. So I think for right now, I'll just go with make this a struct that doesn't have any members. And then and then think about... Uh, think about whether it's worth having struct.new nil for the sake of always being able to instantiate uh, an instruction type, even if it's nullary, versus uh, uh, object.new, uh, i.e. a singleton 
at the expense of needing to remember whether to instantiate it or not. That's a problem for another day. I'm just going to leave it like that for now. So, okay. So if it's a return instruction, then we return a return instruction. Otherwise, we leave it alone. And the matching change on this side, well, I'm going to need to require AST. Oh, hold on. This is going to need to be like AST return. Um, I'd rather not. Let's, for now, let's include AST here and likewise on this side. Just so that I can write those, because that will allow me to... Um, uh, class baz uh, include foo uh, def wibble <laughs> that can return bar like that allows me to just refer to bar even though it's in the foo namespace because I've included foo here the constant resolution will use the the ancestor chain in addition to the lexical scope like constant resolution is a bit of a nightmare in in ruby um i'm hoping that nadia is going to give a talk about this soon but i don't know if she's actually going to do it about constant resolution that was just my that was my suggestion of a thing that's weird in ruby but anyway the upshot of it is if you include a module you can refer to its constants i could have saved a, a lot of everyone's time by just saying that um but also I wanted to check that I was right about that before I, before I just plowed on with it. Um, so my hope is that having done that, well, okay, so if I don't change anything, then I think the evaluate function is going to choke on that object because it's not going to know what to do with it. So if I run the tests, yeah, evaluate, You've I've... I found this AST return object and I don't know what to do with it because it was expecting an atom in an S expression. And I now it's it's got this weird hybrid um, collection of almost everything is an S expression, but there's also this surprise AST object in it. But like I said, because it's Ruby, I don't really have to worry about well, what on earth is the type signature of this evaluate function? Like, what is the type of this expression argument? It's just like, don't think about it. We can just check to see whether this is an instance of that return class here. And this would work with it being a, um, if it was a singleton as well. But again, I think it's, it's slightly more obvious that this is checking the class of the object rather than just checking a, for a specific instance. Um, so let's see, is that right? So this is exactly what I wanted, you know. I I wanted to be able to cut over individual, um, individual instructions, and I realise it's taken me three hours to get to the point where I'm ready to do that. But I feel like I've got all of the infrastructure in place now. I've got the AST parser. I've cleaned up a bunch of unnecessary code in the parsing parts of the evaluator that I'm intending to move over into the parser now. So I think this, this is basically an atomic change, I think. Um, well, is it? Let's just see. I think there might be less than that I can. In the AST parser, I definitely did some work here, didn't I? Um... Let's just make this uh, like that. So this is just laboriously, instead of just returning the S expression directly, now it's iterating over each instruction in that S expression and then copying it into the output. And then it's, so this is, 
it was saying the word machinery before that made me realize that there is actually some machinery here um that i hadn't that could actually live on its own i think that's fine that's fine uh so let's just say uh iterate over s expression in parse expression to build result and then So, yeah, Vim doesn't even know that anything happened. That's great. Um, so, yes. Okay, that's that's more palatable to me. That, like, it's a slightly smaller change where now I'm just actually checking to see what that instruction is. Um, Um, change my mind again. Okay, so this. st.rb uh, Git's not very good at, or I'm not very good at Git in this situation. So this is what I wanted, was like just introduce an AST module um, and include it in interpreter and AST parser. And the reason I'm making that commit is just so that I can say, uh, so that I can start implementing uh, classes for each instruction type and also refer to them without having to prefix them with uh, AST every time. Okay. All right, and then this is kind of the minimum viable change, right? It's like uh, introduce return instruction. Uh, What am I actually doing here? Um, it's like, I suppose it's like, parse it, parse, uh, parse, return instruction. I'm also think I'm thinking about what a future commit is going to look like. Um, Okay, um, so I think I think the grind starts now. I think what I need to do is grind through all of these instructions and untangle them, untangle the parsing bit from the evaluation bit. And like in this case, you can see that that's quite easy. Let's do it. Uh, I wish I didn't have to do this every time, but I'm stuck on Ruby 3.1 until Ruby 3.2 comes out. Well, I could actually build Ruby 3.2. Maybe I'll do that for next time because I'm getting pretty tired of being stuck in the past of Ruby 3.1. Um, and maybe I could use the new, I could use the Rust widget as well, which might make my test run a bit faster, although a JIT of any form probably won't help very much with how f how few operations there are in my in my test. But anyway, um, so if we make that struct and 
the pausing bit of it is this. And here we say local get dot new name. So we've parsed the name out and then we've stuck it in that struct. And now we don't need this bit anymore. We just say in local get name. And then all of this business happens. Um, although he says that. this thing this name thing could be a integer this is also parsing really um mm, okay let me think about that let's have a look see at what the deal actually is uh instructions variable instructions local dot get x local id x so what can this be oh id x is index so maybe i maybe this is an opportunity for me to do what I haven't been doing so far, and which is actually read the spec or refer to it, if not read it, and like try and pick up some of the nouns from it. So if this argument is an index, then maybe this is an opportunity to call it index rather than, because name is pretty weak source. So let's say that's the index of the local. And then this is saying that, well, Oh, how deep into this do I want to get? Oh, I I don't want to get into this. But the thing I'm the thing I'm shying away from here is that what this notation here means is that well, I'll stop talking about that because we're thinking about local index, but these are all the same. So a local index is either a number which here is referred to as x or it's an id which is uh, one of these strings that begins with a dollar. And that's what's going on with this code here, is that this 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 parsing code is not content merely to extract the name. Uh, let's, let's call them index before I forget. Not content merely to extract the index. Uh, it also needs to check to see whether it's Basically, what we're doing is checking to see which of these two categories we're in. Are we in the category of it's already a number or are we in the category where it's an ID? And the bit I'm shying away from is that this double rightward arrow is talking about, basically, it's talking about the function that I'm currently implementing. It's talking about, well, let's look. Productions are written, symbol, double colon equals, blah de blah de blah, where each AI is the attribute that is synthesized for sim in the given case, usually from attribute variables bound in TI. So what that is actually saying is that... Uh, is that these rules are, sorry, I'm just reading the text. These rules are telling you how to, it's like, it's saying um, the attribute grammar implicitly defines a parsing function. So what that's talking about is it's saying, this is how you turn concrete syntax into abstract syntax. Hey, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Um, and the, okay, I still haven't said the thing I'm showing away from. The thing I'm showing away from is that this, so this is saying, Okay, let's back up. If you find a local.get instruction, then that parses into local.get x. Okay, well, that's sort of what I want to do here. Like, I am parsing. I have found a, a concrete local.get. It's got a static argument, which, I'm, which I now know is the index. I've, I've fetched that. 
And now I want to convert that into abstract syntax. But the X here, when you look at this local index um, production, it's saying that if it's not a number, if it's an ID, then it still needs to be turned into a number in the abstract syntax. And then it's like, well, okay, how do I know what number to turn it into? And the answer is, you have to look it up in an identifier context. So here, this is saying, identifiers are looked up in the suitable space of the identifier context I. So the identifier context has got some locals in it, and you can look up that ID to find out what value corresponds to, well, I mean, this is sort of saying do a reverse lookup. It's saying, like, find the X such that locals, so that the index in this locals part of the identifier context gives you that ID. Now, I don't have this, at least not yet, and I think I'm just going to sort of punt on it. So I think there's an opportunity here for me to do s more of the parsing here, but not all of it. So I think what I'm going to do is, like, for example, I can easily do this. Okay, I can easily do some of this, right? Like, I can get the index. And then what I can do with that is that I can check to see whether it begins with a dollar. Um, yeah, we don't need any of that. So I can do this simple thing. So I'm a bit confused here because in some places I've converted IDs into symbols, but clearly here I'm not doing that. Oh, maybe it's just when they're being used. Yeah, the reason I was doing that when they were being used uh, as labels is because if I'm going to throw them, then they need to be it needs to have object identity equality in order for the corresponding catch to work. So that's why I'm turning that into a symbol. Yeah, okay, all right, that makes sense. Um, okay, so it's not completely arbitrary. Um, nevertheless, it is kind of tempting to turn this into a symbol, but... I will resist that for now. So yeah, what I'm going to do here is that if it starts with a dollar, then I guess I'll just leave it alone. Um, yeah, let's say unless index start with dollar, then... Well, no, hold on. Okay, I, I, I would prefer... I would prefer to just have a top level assignment here. Index equals, if index start with dollar, index. And the reason I, although this is sort of pointless, the reason I'm doing this is that this is sort of an affordance for me to think about, do I want this to become index to sim? Like what is the operation? Or even do I just want it to be um, index delete prefix dollar like what do we do with IDs um, I don't know I'm just going to leave it there for now but what we do do here is that if it doesn't start with a dollar then it must be a number so we're going to call 2i and it's a base 10 number well that's already that code has already been written. So I think this is this is all of the parsing I'm prepared to do right now. So this takes us all, all the way to the point of recording this index and actually knowing whether it is a number or an ID. So we've got that far. And then that and we, we need that information here actually, because we have to either look it up using array ASOC here, or we have to use array slice if it's a number. So this is going to change to case index in integer and I'm not actually using that. That's bad programming by me. Thanks me. 
else. Um, like that. And I'm going to, while I'm in here, I'm just going to change this to be like this because I'm doing so much destructuring that it makes sense to just use pattern matching everywhere. I mean, this would be, that's overkill. If, if that's the only point in your program where you're using a pattern match, then it would be silly to do it like this. But I'm doing basically everywhere that I'm taking a compound value apart, I'm doing it with patterns. And that wasn't true when I first wrote this code, but it's now extremely true given unfold and everything. So I think I'm gonna, so, Yeah, so I think that's right. So you can see that, that the work is now divided between, this is recognizing the literal instruction in the S expression. It knows the staticarity of that instruction and it knows a little bit about the syntax of the index and it's able to do all of that work up front and, and store the result of that work in the AST that it returns. And then on this side, we're getting the benefit of that work in that we just we just switch on, I guess this should be in string. So it's either a number or a string, and then we'll raise an exception if it's neither of those things. And then we just have to look it up in the locals, which is of course not available um, to the parser because this has only been populated during the execution of the code um, to pull the right value out. And then that gets pushed onto the stack. Yeah, I'm just I'm just looking at this, wondering whether there's a nicer way of writing this. There is, but I'm not going to take the time to discover it right now. Oh, well, that worked well. No implicit conversion of string into integer. Well, that's because I've got them the wrong way around, isn't it? Simply... If I was me, I would simply not make rudimentary errors. That's how I would play it. Okay, so the place where we want to get to later is, yeah, so let's um, uh, actually look up indexes, e.g. for local.get in an identifier context. I mean, it's this is totally doable, right? I don't think this is going to be too challenging. It just means that you have to build up this. Like, this identifier context is just a lookup table that tells you what are all the local variables that are lexically available at this point in the program. And like we can, we can build that up by, well, I mean, it, I'm not, it's actually not very easy because at the moment I'm only parsing expressions, but if I was parsing modules and function definitions and stuff, which include local variable declarations and function argument, function parameters, like by the time I get inside the body, parsing the body of the function, I have already chewed my way through the names of all the function parameters and the names of all the locals and so I would have that information. I would just have to keep it around somewhere and I could just look this index up in that identifier context and turn it into an integer, but uh, I'm not ready to do that yet. So I'm just going to leave it. So I think I've done that. Um, yes, I have done that. And I realize I've sort of changed more than is strictly necessary there. But I think doing a little bit of cleanup as I go is probably not a bad thing. Uh, let me just make a note here. Um, eventually, we'll want to look up the index in the, in the locals space of the identifier context. So the, an identifier context has got several of these lookup tables in it, right? And the one that we would want to use here um, is the locals space 
of the identifier context. Um, I think I really just want to link to indices here. That's the relevant part. Uh, but I don't have an identifier context yet because I'm only parsing expressions at the moment, not module definitions, which contain the function definitions that create local variables. For now, I'll for now, I'm going to allow both string and integer indexes and let the interpreter deal with it. In future, I'll come back and clean this up so that the index is always an integer. And obviously that will make the interpreter simpler, right? Because then the interpreter won't need to have this conditional in it, it will always do this. Um, so I'm still, I'm kicking the can down the road a little bit here, but not too much. Um, all right, let's continue. Uh, local set and local get, I think. I wonder how far through this I'm going to get. Let's see. Maybe if I talk a bit less and work a bit more, it won't be such an issue. Uh... So let's think about what this wants to do. So what do I want this to look like on this side? I want this to look like in, I've already forgotten what it is, local set and local T. Uh, um, this is a little bit inconvenient because I can't just bind the index in both of these places because you're not allowed to do that. Um, in a pattern match, uh, which is annoying, isn't it? Why can't you do that? Everything else about binding local variables is uh, quite rough around the edges, but for some reason this restriction exists. Um, I suppose I can just, I suppose I can retrieve the index myself. It just feels, you know, it feels like a bit of a trial to have to do that. Um, I suppose Yeah, I guess I can just, I guess I'll just pick it out. And I'm thinking ahead to places where I might have multiple of these. You know, like what happens if I've, if I've got this situation where basically the only thing that's varying is the instruction type and otherwise they have the same, virtually the same implementation and exactly the same attributes. I mean, I don't know if that's going to crop up anywhere else, but I suppose the thing to do here is to take the instruction and deconstruct it in this way. So say, okay, fine. The pattern match isn't gonna let me extract that index, but once I've done this, then I know that I can do this part. Um, so, and then we pop the value off. This thing here is, I'm gonna just do the same thing as above. So this is gonna become if it's a string, then we're setting the value in this. Yeah, okay, this is just retrieving an array. Um, and then this is in integer. Uh, we've, we're going to do that in the parser. Okay. And then this is going to be in uh, local t. 
Um, I think that's what I want on the interpreter side. Again, it'll be nice when I can get rid of this conditional, but I'm just going to live with it for now because I don't have that identifier context at this point. Um, so what's this going to do? It does that. That's not parsing, that's execution. Um, and then maybe the code is the same as this index equals if index start with blah 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 and actually tantalizingly this is yeah I'm not sure what to do here what I was going to say was this is basically the same implementation as um It's the same implementation as local get, right? So, I'm just trying to think if there's a nice way for me to sh for me to share this. Um, maybe not, maybe not. But it would be nice if there was. It'd be nice if I could just. Can I, I'm just trying to think of a way of doing this that isn't really unpleasant. Um, maybe I just need to, maybe I just need to bite the bullet. Um, Maybe it's okay if I, yeah, sorry, I keep, I keep thinking of different ways of doing this. I think this is probably the least gross, right? If I, if I take the win of combining those, then maybe it's okay if I just have a case in here. <laughs> um, I mean, I could just stick stick those class names in a hash though that's the thing that i'm how how horrible is that if i say let's just think about this uh instruction new index how bad should i feel about that oh what have i done oh this is not called name it's called index Oh, yeah, okay, you make a good point, MRI. That does not actually exist. I mean, those three things are very similar, aren't they? <laughs> Let's not think about that too much. Um, yeah, I mean, I think for right now, I'm going to... I think maybe I am going to go with that. It's not incredibly beautiful, but it sort of minimizes syntactically the part that varies, you know, rather than having a case statement that's doing local get dot new, local set dot new, local t dot new. Oh. Well, I've broken something, haven't I? Okay, what have I done wrong? 
Oh, it's, it's just that I haven't called that index. Uh, let me deal with the spam. Okay, I've dealt with the spam. Uh, yeah, I just forgot to rename this, thankfully. So I live in hope. That this is going to work. Okay. Pending test failed successfully. Um. Yeah, that all looks good. Um, parse local set and local T instructions. Um, I've combined uh, the parsing of these with local.get because they all look the same. Uh, because all three instructions have the same static arity and all take a static argument of the same type, i.e. a local index. Ah, uh, how many tests are you passing at the moment? I do not know. Um, I mean, it depends on whether you're. It depends on whether you mean these individual assertions or like overall these. I mean, we can we can have a look at in test.sh at the moment. Uh, let's have a look here in test core. So these are all of the files that I could potentially be running. How many files are there in here? There's no way for GitHub to tell me. Quite a lot. Um, of those, I'm successfully running 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. So 16 of those are passing. Um, uh, let's have a look. Spec core... Uh, test core star dot wast okay out of 90 so that's not particularly impressive is it but as you can see there are a lot of individual assertions in those tests and a lot of those have been extremely hard ones so I'm you know defensively uh, quite a lot of assertions are passing even though I've actually got very poor coverage of the WebAssembly language, but I'm hoping that there's going to be, <laughs> this is such a, I have I learned nothing? I don't understand why I'm even thinking this, let alone saying it, but I'm hoping that there's going to be sort of stoppy starty progress that like, I'm still actually building up momentum. I'm still implementing a blooming parser here. I'm hoping that once I pull myself up out of this swamp of like, just getting all of the infrastructure working and getting everything hooked together correctly and having an AST and all that kind of stuff dealing with, you know, I've only just figured out how to execute unfolded instructions. I'm hoping that some of this stuff I'm going to be able to chew through more quickly than what I've done so far because it turned out that some of the stuff I started with, like floating point numbers, actually turned out to be a massive pain. Um, so I'm hoping that things like just implementing globals or just implementing labels or just making load and store work properly are going to be like a bit less onerous than the stuff I've picked so far. But of course, that's not based on evidence because so far everything has turned out to be way more complicated than I thought it was going to be. So if anything, um, the evidence suggests that it's going to continue to get worse. But right now it feels like I'm actually building momentum <laughs> towards actually being able to make more of these things pass, but we'll see if that actually happens. 
Um, all right, I'm going to continue with this. Uh, this one next. Brr if. Maybe I should have copied and pasted this whole... Um, this whole interpret, this whole evaluate function first, but um, I didn't. Um, so let's see again, like while I'm, uh, while I'm being pedantic, why don't we see what is the kind of argument that this br if takes? Ah. It is also an index, but it is a label index. And again, we're supposed to be looking that up. Oh, hold on, hold on. These are different. Oh, no, they're not. It is just a number. It's just that they're called X. They're called L instead of X. But it is still... Just a number. It's just a U32. Shall I call it index? Hmm. I sort of probably should, shouldn't I? <sighs> yeah, I'll just do that. I'll just commit to the bit. Um, doesn't feel great because, yeah, for all of these labels, it's not going to feel great because I'm just not looking them up in the context. But at least, at least this is going to minimize churn in the future. And I just have to deal with the fact that indexes are sort of uninterpreted at this stage. And the and the interpreter has to do the interpreting, even though they can be statically interpreted because, because they're just an index into some information that's lexically available while we're parsing it. It's not like runtime information, but um, I'm just gonna have to deal with it. Okay, yeah, so here, the unless condition zero part and the, oh, hold on. Okay, sorry. Yes. The unless condition zero part and the stack pop part are runtime. This is parsing stuff. The throw is runtime. Uh, and also this bit. Um, I think I am going to do the converting it to a symbol because it does need to be one uh, for Ruby reasons. And I can't just, it would be a, maybe I can. Yeah, actually, I think maybe it's better if that happens in the interpreter because the reason why it needs to be a symbol is intimately related to the semantics of catch and throw in Ruby. Um, so I think I'm going to let that keep living in the in the interpreter for now. I mean... Ultimately, that's all of that faff is going to go away when I start looking things up in the um, in the identifier context, because numbers don't have the problem that strings do with respect to object identity. But 
for right now, the interpreter needs to do that bit of shimming of converting it into a symbol to make it work with throw. And I think it's okay for that work to happen on this side with knowledge of whether the label, whether the index is a string or not, basically. It'll help me to remember that that work is being done somewhere and that it should go away because I should be looking things up in the identifier context. So let's leave it like that. And then this just becomes br if index. Um, and then here, when we get a br if with an index, uh, don't need to do that. Notice that in all these cases, we're not touching rest. You know, we're, we're, we're dwindling down the number of things here that are touching rest. And by the time we get to the end of this, none of these are going to be touching rest because the instruction that they've received in this sort of heterogeneous collection of parsed and unparsed instructions is going to be the complete thing they need to do the evaluation because they come packaged up with all of their with all of their static arguments right so when we get to that point this while loop can go away and it can just be expression dot each um, but for now we need to keep it as it is um, so here popping the stack is evaluation checking the condition is evaluation um, now we need a case index in string do this uh, else do this we don't need to integerify it anymore this isn't else it's in integer which is hard to type because of capital letters um, So yeah, I think that's okay. I clearly need a helper here to deal with um, looking up indexes, but uh, let's not get distracted by that just yet. Um, so does that look sensible? BR if, BR if. Uh, that's just doing the runtime stuff. That looks good. That seems convincing to me. I probably need to run all this every time. Maybe I'll go on a tear and do a few of these and then run the tests at the end to celebrate. Oh, look, I made an error. Good job that I didn't go on a tear and change loads of them. <laughs> uh, what's that float expres? That's the last one. Okay, looks good. Good catch test suite, thank you. It's just a silly error, a typo. Um, okay, uh, I've got sort of, I've got repetition here of the stuff around the index, but um, yeah, I don't want to do something about that. What's the argument to throw called? Tag. Well, let's do that. Down here, let's say throw tag branch. Sounds like a, I'm writing a git client. And then we get the tag by switching on the type of the instruction, of uh, the, sorry. Okay, that makes it clear what varies here, I think. Um, okay, I like that a bit better. Uh, let's just double check that hasn't broken anything. 
Okay. Okay, so this is pause. What is it? BR underscore if? Yeah. I don't really understand when there are dots and when there are underscores, but there, there are them. So we just got to pay attention, which is not something I'm particularly good at. All right, okay, let's let's pick up the pace here. Select. I mean, this is this is obviously fairly tedious now, um, but welcome to my streams. Uh, stack pop is computation. Oh, look. This doesn't. This is just nullery. Um. So that was actually way easier than I was expecting. Um, uh, and then here, this just becomes select. So this doesn't need any, this doesn't take any static, static arguments at all. Um, I'm just gonna use that float expert as a, as a stress test for, for now to keep things moving along. Um, okay, that was easy. Uh, pause, select. Uh, what next? Nop, I think this is going to be similarly straightforward. Uh, nop equals struct new nil. Um, how do I pause that? In nop, nop new. I think I actually had to add not for float expres. So if that's working there, then that's a good sign. Uh, pause not instruction. Uh, next call. All right. Well, I haven't actually implemented this properly yet, as you can see. But okay, what does call take? Uh, instructions. Oh, I have to go up here to get the actual table of contents. Very bad. Uh, is call a control instruction? Perhaps it is. Um, why? Oh, these are all control instructions. What? Am I just confused about whether it's a control instruction? Oh no, here it is. Cool. Index. Ah, oh, function index. These also need to turn into numbers. Okay, well, I'm gonna, like I said, I'm gonna commit to the bit and just do this. I suppose that suggests I should really be doing this business with it. I'm just going to do that. Um, I might live to regret that, but oh, can I just add it to that? Is that too cheeky? I don't know that it is actually. I think that's probably fine. I mean, that's harmless, isn't it? Oh, hold on. Oh no, it's syntactically. I was like, does it have to start with a dollar? But I think it does. This is just an ID. And it has to start with a dollar. Um, oh, there aren't any call instructions here, but let's, is there like a call.wast? Let's just double check. Yeah, it certainly looks like whenever you want to give a function an ID, you have to start it with a dollar. Um, so yeah, let's just, let's just, I think that's a much better reason for doing the, for pre-processing the index is that like, it's just 
one of the instructions that has an index. Um, this will necessarily get more elaborate if and when I start doing that identifier context lookup, but for right now, I think that's fine. Um, and then what do we do on the interpreter side? So this is if call index. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. So it's fine, we don't actually do any work here anyway. Um, Float Express doesn't even, ah, uh, yes. Yeah, I mean, obviously I'm signing myself up for a bunch of pointless busy work here. Um, but apparently that's my, that's my thing. Let's just run the tests of this because I'm a little bit suspicious about, I've actually added something that I wasn't previously doing, which is trying to call two integer on that thing if it doesn't start with a dollar. So let's just double check that doesn't cause any problems. But if it does, I've seriously misunderstood the language spec. Okay, this is looking promising because we've got all the way to float expres dot last. Oh, I've got that const, but okay, that's all good. Um, uh, so let's say parse call instruction. Um, so why didn't I do that with the other thing that has an index? Why didn't I do that with br if? I don't think I have a good reason for that. I think that was a mistake. Um, let's just write this commit message. As this is assuming I've gone back and fixed the problem. As with br if, uh, call uses an index that should be looked up in a different uh, identifier context space than uh, those than indexes from local dot get local dot set etc. But since we're not actually doing any lookup yet, we might as well share the lower level code that distinguishes IDs from numbers. But then let's um, let's just look at how far was it that far back? Yeah, I guess. So I think actually, if I'm gonna if I'm gonna truly commit to this bit, then I need to. This is what commitment looks like. Never mind this nonsense. We've got tons of instructions here that take indexes. Uh, Flow expres. That looks good. Um, uh, let's. This should be an easy merge conflict to resolve. Uh, yes. Just delete all that crap and put oh this was select right yes yes sorry I thought it had stopped at call but now it has um, so we just need to uh, do this and then do this and then do this and then do this uh, and then keep all of this and then just do this if I was one of those you know trailing final comma people then I wouldn't have had that problem but then I would have had the problem of being one of those people so I pick your poison haven't you
Okay, that's better. And then let's just, uh, well, let's reword this. Uh, and let's remind ourselves of what I said here. And when I say remind ourselves, I mean just copy. As a as a starting point, um, call uses an index that should be looked up in a different identifier context space than index is from local to get the sense of not actually doing it. Yeah, I mean, I, I potentially over explained this in g given that this is coming first. Um, so why don't I cut this down a little bit? Um, but we're, but for the sake of convenience, we're saving that work until later. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, next. How far am I from the end of this? Oh, I'm pretty close to the end of it. Although I haven't looked, I've, I've not done numeric instructions yet, which is really the bulk of them. Although I think maybe that can just be a single one of these classes. I'm not going to make one for plus and one for minus and one for times and one for floating point plus and one for floating point minus and one for floating point times because even I have my limits. Um, so this looks like drop is just nullary. Uh, I don't know why I deleted that, but here in drop, drop.new, I mean, you can see there's, I could in principle coalesce all of these nullary instructions and just do the same thing as, I, as I've done here, which is sort of tempting. Um, let's not get distracted by that just yet. drop instruction okay okay well this is <laughs> we've saved the best till last here haven't we uh, let's have this whole piece of sorry business um, and let's take it over here so Okay, so that's all of that. And let's do the same on this side as well. Uh, can I do, can I do this motion? Yes, okay. Um, sorry, I accidentally started to think about Vim then. That was, that is not why anyone is here. Unless Drew Neal is here, but I don't think he is. Hi, Drew. Um, he won't see that. Uh, okay, what am I doing? Okay, let's think about the parsing side first. Ah, oh, classic. Oh, okay, optional label. Interesting. All right, well, let's, again, let's find out what this actually is, Not not my invented interpretation of how these how these things work okay so this this legitimately is a label So it's either, syntactically, it's either an ID or, or nothing. So it's optional. And then here, this is talking about updating the identifier context by adding that ID to the labels 
space in the identifier context. Oh, because, right, because by the time we turn it into abstract syntax here, the label goes away. So on this, these labels don't, <laughs> these labels don't make it into the abstract syntax. When we're finished, these, this is, this is just used to establish the contents of that identifier context. And then the idea is that when you actually encounter a BR if or whatever, something that actually uses a label, then you look it up in that context and you don't, you know, here we're just sort of storing that ID directly in the abstract syntax. But what you're supposed to do is look it up so that it turns into a number. So we're at this sort of weird, in this sort of weird transitional situation where we're not ready to do that yet. So I think I'm going to call it label because that's what it is. Why do we want this to be zero? I think it's because we were using that as a special... I actually can't remember. I thought we were throwing zero somewhere. I hope I didn't inadvertently remove that. Oh, no, I don't think we do do it explicitly. It's just that it's a default for yeah, it's because okay, yeah, this is all this is all a massive hack, but the nature of the massive hack is that because we don't support because we don't really support these these numbers yet. So it's it's for this function specifically, I think. Because inside here it says BR if zero. And what that means is well actually I think there was another one before this. It's not it's not just for this one, but this is the the example that's freshest in my mind, this is trying to jump to this block. And this block doesn't have a label. The zero actually means count zero, count that many nested scopes outwards. So that zero actually means the immediate nested scope. So far, we haven't had to execute anything that has anything other than a zero here. So that's just a bit of a hack to say, if the label's missing, then pretend that the label was zero so that if we encounter a jump to label uh, index zero it just works automatically so that whole thing is pretty grim but let's i'll just i'll just let it be so that's the bit of parsing we're doing at the moment i will leave it um that's us parsing the type i will leave it why don't i delete those things from here and then we're sort of whittling down what's going on here. So here, case instruction in block, consume structured instruction rest terminated by, and that's all parsing. And then that bit is execution. In loop, that's parsing, that's execution, that's parsing, and all that is execution. So if I just and then each of these is like block dot new what do we call the contents of a block? It says in instra in instra So, I mean, I suppose I could make up my own name for this and just call it body. You know, like, I, I made up consequent and alternative for these. Is that actually what... What does Wikipedia say those are called? Have I... I every time I say them, I feel like I've... Oh, go away. 
terminology. Consequent alternative. Okay, fine. I guess I guess that is the right name. Um, well, I have I can't just call them instructions in an if because there's two of them. So I think what I'm going to do is call them body here. Um, because I think that's the most natural name for them. <laughs> Um, um, is there a way that I can arrange for this to just be the right variable name? Yes, there is. And then I can use my fancy pants hash punning business here. Um, Okay, so I think that's all of the parsing work for those instructions. Um, obviously, we will need these in st.rb um, equals struct. Uh, struct and then oh of course these that wasn't really very helpful was it these will need to be rejigged and then they all need keyword in it true um, so I think that's the parsing bit and I think it makes sense to keep them even though I'm basically switching on instruction here again, I think it's worth keeping this bit here because this is the this preamble is the thing that detects the optional label, and that is we do need to share that among all of these. I mean, again, maybe if I just had a helper that said like parse label that can return, you know, zero or or ultimately nil then maybe it'd be better for me to just share it among those uh, to, to promote these to the top level and just reuse that helper in each one so that they stand alone. Um, but I think for now, I'm just going to leave that as is. Okay. Um, oh, consequent and alternate. Okay. Thanks, Owen. That's interesting. Yeah, that was the thing that I was thinking about was that my in my head I was kind of saying like alternate <laughs> or alternate. Um but I mean if it's on Wikipedia then it must be true. Well, at least it means that there's one other person in the world who thinks that it's called that. Um let's see if then else expressions compound statements conditional uh, two-way choice oh well I'm, I'm not going to get sucked into that that's doesn't matter what it's called does it they can be called foo and bar um, right what am I doing ah yes okay so this is not this anymore this is now See, I think I can handle these separately now. I don't think there's any point in... Because all of the stuff that was shared about them was to do with parsing, not to do with evaluation, because the whole point of these is that their evaluation semantics is very different. Um, so, for block, it be this for label, sorry, for loop, it be this. And for if, it be this, crucially including the popping of the stack to get the condition. So, um, all of that
Um, I mean, that is much nicer, isn't it? Like, you can really see what evaluating a block... Oh, except I've forgotten. Except I've forgotten the body. Hold on. I've... <laughs> I'm not thinking here. Okay, so these need a label. And they also need a body. I was being very silly here. They all come with a label. They're all going to need a type eventually, but I'm not bothering to store that. Okay, so back to the AST mines. Um, these all need a label. Um, label, body, consequent, alternative. Yeah, that's correct. Okay. Okay, I've included that in all of them. So now I have to go back and say this needs also needs a body, which is that. This needs a body. Um which is that. And this needs a label. And, a and they were already called a consequent and alternative. And this doesn't even try to... Well, what's the label for here? I guess it really is so that you can... It's just because it's nested... Oh, that's just, okay. I, I This is making me understand what these IDs at the end are for, which is just that they balance the label. So you label the start of the block, block dollar foo, and then at the end you're allowed to say end dollar foo, but it looks like it's, that doesn't carry through into the abstract syntax, so I don't think it has any bearing on the, oh yeah, look. The same label identifier may optionally be repeated after the corresponding end and else pseudo instructions to indicate the matching delimiters. So that's, it doesn't do anything. Um, yeah, but I guess because this introduces a new nested block, or two of them, it, it looks like you can, if you wanted to, you could jump out of this. Maybe? But I actually don't know. Um, anyway, that's a mystery for the future. I guess we'll find out what that whether that label actually has any semantic value or if it's just something you can put in your source code to balance your ifs and your ends. Um, so for now, we're not using it. Um, shall I leave it in any way? I suppose I will. I think it's nice if the signatures here of the of these AST classes sort of match what's available in them. Um, and that'll help me to spot when something's being unused because if it's not even mentioned there, I won't even remember that, that, is a, that that's a member of that struct. Whereas when I review that code in the future, I'll be able to think about like, oh, this label here is dead. Why is that? And the answer is either because... We haven't finished implementing conditions yet. This actually should have a catch, you know, label around it. Um, or it's the, it's not, it's not necessary. Um, actually, I'm tempted to push this down into a, into a ternary, you know. Uh... Condition zero, alternative, or consequent. Because there's now so little code in this that I might as well just squish it together like that, I think. Before, when it was part of loads of stuff, it wasn't a problem. But now I think having it on one line actually makes it easier to see what's going on with this. Um, and part of the reason I'm saying that is because if I do need to put it inside a catch label, I think that's 
you know, a little a little easier to do now. Um, let's see what at least float experts say. Oh, yes. Good point, well made, MRI. Um, this consume structured instruction method is ne is necessary. <laughs> uh, structured instruction. So that is not, this is now orphaned. It's not being called by anyone else because it's only for parsing. It only recursively calls itself. It doesn't have any any actual callers in this class. So I can just pull that out entirely and plop it in here, I think. And yeah, this is when I'm re this is where I feel relieved that I didn't um that I didn't still have that split on else business like cuz I knew this would be coming over into the parser and it's a real relief that it's self-contained and there's not multiple methods involved like the fact that I can just reuse it here is incredibly convenient um so let's have a look loop no matching pattern error oh right uh what no hold on what oh yes i forgot to do something haven't i which is that the body needs to be parsed <laughs> So this needs to be parse expression body, of course. So the body of this must not be an S expression. It has to be an AST. Um, uh, let's do this. Consequent. Yeah. Okay. Let's let's do this. Let's do this more consistently. Body equals parse expression body. Is that it? Yes. So we have to parse the body. We have to parse the body. And then here, uh, consequent alternative map parse expression is going to go into Ah, why doesn't Vim know how to indent this? Back into consequent and alternative. Okay. Okay, so that one was a little bit more fiddly. Um, just because of things, I had to bring that. I had to bring that whole method over with me. Uh. And yeah, there was a bit of fiddliness about, I sort of hadn't noticed that if, ha, well, I mean, I'd, I'd implemented it, but I hadn't noticed they had labels, hadn't really thought about it. Um, oh, I suppose I should also in here, just for consistency, rename expression to S expression so that it's clear in the absence of a static type system, exactly what I'm talking about here. See, I've still got this business at the beginning, which is a bit weird, but otherwise that seems fine. Um, I hope it doesn't seem like I'm running the tests compulsively. I'm trying to run them responsibly rather than... I do save compulsively. I try not to run the tests compulsively, but um, I realize the, the needle is right on the edge of the red zone there. Um, I just want I just want as much confidence as I can get that I haven't broken something. Um, okay, it's fine for now. I can see lots of ways that I could clean that up, but that'll uh, next time I'll clean it up. Um, so for now, this is really just parse um, so what is this block? loop and if instructions 
no Oxford comma. This is a respectable, family-friendly stream where we don't have horrendous crimes against grammar like the Oxford commas. Um, uh, this is a little more complicated and requires moving the... Oh, this is going to wrap... Gosh darn it. Helper over from the interpreter. But it's still not too bad. Uh, what did I want to say about... Oh yeah. We're defaulting the label... Uh, a missing... We're defaulting the label to zero as a hack to support... Um, cases, e.g. the tau function in float expres.last uh, to support cases where the label is missing but the branch inside the block specifies uh, index zero. Um, the label isn't even supposed to survive the parsing process. Uh, the labels just populate the identifier context and uh, turn and any references to them turn into numbers when when looked up in that context. Um, so this whole thing is just a transitional uh, bodge until we get identifier context working arrangement lamentable okay all right well that's the end of this top level parsing uh, evaluate function and now it only contains evaluate -y stuff, which is rather exciting. Look, I think if this code here is going to say square brackets 1, which it has to because this is an L value and the, the method it's using here is the square brackets equals method to assign into the array, I think that this should just use square brackets 1 even though it's an R value so that it looks the same, and then we don't need to do this. I think that's what should happen. But that's just my opinion. Oh, fortunately, only my opinion matters here. So, uh, yes, it is this one. Let's just do that, and then no one will ever know. Okay, cool. Um, all right, so yes, great. Top level, evaluate, done. Um, so now I have to simply evaluate numeric instruction. <laughs> um, Let's think about how that's going to work. How do numeric instructions work in the text format? Okay. All 
right, well, that's not super informative. That's just telling me that there are lots of them. Let's have a look at, so this structure here, we never really, haven't really looked at this very much, but this whole structure section is defining what the canonical abstract syntax looks like. So, I mean, my abstract syntax doesn't have to be the same as this, but the execution is in terms of this abstract syntax, right? So, you know, the text format tells you how to map a concrete S expression onto the abstract syntax. This section specifies the abstract syntax, and then this execution section tells you how to execute the abstract syntax. So the closer I hew to this, to the specs abstract syntax, the less thinking I have to do about, you know, how does evaluation work essentially. So I am at least vaguely interested in what they've written down here. Um, not least just because I want to know what the names of things are um, so that I don't have to come up with them myself. Okay, so numeric instructions, const, const, Hmm. So look, this is rather nice. They do have, they've sort of divided things up into sort of categories here. They've got unary operators, unary binary test, uh, I wonder, well, let's have a look. Let's see in here what I might be able to do. Okay, look, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna just copy this method <laughs> um, and stick it in here, but I'm gonna call it, well, I mean, for now, I'm just gonna stick it in here. Um, oh, see, that doesn't even, this doesn't even evaluate them. I, mean, I was like, oh, how are we going to evaluate them? It doesn't even, it, it delegates to these things, evaluate integer and evaluate float. So the, the rabbit hole here is quite deep. But maybe I could start with const and load and store and then leave the rest of them alone and see how far that gets me. So here it looks like this hmm is there a way that I'm gonna be able to do this all in one go because it's rather annoying to have the regular expression living in both places So this is going to be parse numeric instruction. This is going to be S expression. There is no locals, at least not yet. I mean, when I've got an identifier context, that's exactly what you'll need, but bad luck. You haven't got one yet. And so this is going to need to return. I think I talked about this already. This is going to need to return a result Well, instruction, I suppose, and rest. So this thing, I mean, why doesn't it, does it not currently do that? Oh yeah, of course, it, all it does is return rest, right. Okay, so the thing that's new is that it's actually gonna return an instruction that is generated in addition to the unconsumed um, the unconsumed part of the S expression. Um, so what could this... The reason I'm hesitating is because the main thing that this gives us is this sort of type and bits and operation business. And yeah, So actually, maybe I could do this a little bit at a time. Maybe, I know this is 
this is stretching credibility a little bit. But look, if I if I take this out and stick it in here, uh, here, I'll need to require helpers here. Um, am I still using helpers? Yes, mask. Okay, yes, and size of. Okay, fine. Um, like what I'm thinking is that this could be case instruction um, in numeric. Hold on, what am I? No, I think this is, I think this is too, this is, it's not that it can't be done, but it's that this is going to be too, this is going to be too large a bite for me to take. It's going to be too large a bite. So, I mean, I still need the regular expression here, but I think what I'm going to do is start, start supporting some of these and so I'm going to have to add them in here maybe above this you know like if I support const for example which I think is the first one so hold on let's um let's do all the substitutions I know I'm going to need to do uh s s expression s expression s expression that's text editing is my passion um, this evaluate needs to be parse. Um, okay, so let's think about, okay, yeah, we return rest at the end. Um, this pulls an instruction off the front of it. You know, what I'm thinking is if I can start fleshing that out so that it can just return cons, then this case will I mean, it doesn't matter whether it's before or after the regular expression, but I'm putting it there just to separate it from the non-numeric ones. Um, then I again, I can start incrementally moving them over. So I think I'm going to do that. I was hoping I could just move this regular expression stuff over, but I think during the cutover, I need it in both places until this until I've gutted this function. Um, oh no! Until until I fully implemented this function. It's it's the other one that's being gutted, um, or at least gutted of its parsing content. Um, in fact, I think what's going to happen here is that, yeah, it's inevitable that what's going to happen here is that parts of evaluate numeric instruction are going to be promoted up into this condition here, right? Like, so what was in... All of this stuff is going to happen as part of parsing, um, inside parse numeric instruction I'm going to do all of this stuff but then this yeah I think this needs to move out because you'll only reach this if it's not a const so this goes here or at least some some of it does. Oh, maybe all of it does, actually. Oh. Okay, let's not think about that too hard. There's more parsing going on inside here. Interpret integer and this wasmin afloat business are parsing the parsing numbers. So that also needs to move out, but let's take this one annoying step at a time um so i think the bit that i pulled out there was all execution uh well yeah ignoring the and ignoring the annoyingness of the fact that it's also parsing stuff let's let's just try to move that piece out first um so what does that look like that says so we do all of this gubbins and then we say, if it, if the operation is const, then we do this. Otherwise, I don't know what you're talking about. There's no one here of that name. Uh, 
Oh yeah, the else here needs to be like Oh, hold on. This is this is actually quite hard. It's hard to do this a piece at a time because you need to know the arity in order to in order to even leave it alone, you need to know the arity. Shit. So I think even my attempt to Yeah, I think there's going to need to be a separate step here that's like, that's just hooking up, parse new, uh, hooking up a, a, a parse numeric instruction method that doesn't do anything yet. Because even not doing anything is actually quite a lot of work or at least it involves knowing the arity of everything. So, yeah, I just don't, I just don't want to make this a massive change. Um, okay, so let's see, what can I, what can I get away with here? Pars numeric instruction. Hold on, how can this possibly work? almost can't see how I'm going to do this. Because I need to return multiple, potentially, not just a single instruction here, it needs to be... Oh, could I use concat temporarily? Is that okay? No. Um, I'm just trying to think how I can support the idea of if I don't know how to parse this, then I then I just return it verbatim because that's what I was that's what I was previously doing here. In fact, yeah, I just need to make it so that. Okay, 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 okay. So so so. All right. Yeah, I guess the secret is. I need to not do this yet. <laughs> uh, that's for people who are ready to parse all of the numeric instructions, right? So this actually needs to be case instruction in const, or that's, oh goodness, okay, all right, this is going to get messy. Um, so it can be f or i, it can be 32 or 64, const. So this is... I'm only doing this temporarily, but this is going to be how I incrementally wire stuff up here. Um, okay, so I think this makes sense. If, if it's const, so this is, this is going to be okay. I mean, I, I appreciate that I might be doing more work than necessary here in order to... in order to make it incremental, but this is really the only way that I know to ratchet up progress on the, on the problem. If I try and do it as one big change, the chances of it working are basically zero. 
Um, so I was talking rubbish here. That's not evaluation. That's getting the that's getting the argument. I mean, it's either an integer or a float. It's basically a number. Let's call that number. I know it's called value there, but um, for now, that's going, that's staying in the interpreter, although I think that's wrong. Um, but for now, let's just leave it in there as a, I mean, it's a string. <laughs> so number is not the best name for it, but that's what it is. So I think this is just going to be const.new. So we need to know all of this stuff. We need to know type. Is it is it float or integer? We need to know bits. Is it 32 or 64? And we need to know the number. And then I'm calling this number because as soon as this is working, I want to move the parsing, the number parsing into this. Um, so it really is going to be a number. It's only temporarily a string. Um, okay, so only call this function if if you've got if you've got a const operation, basically. Um, okay. Well, of course I haven't done that yet. That's the boring bit. Const struct new uh, type bits number keyword in it true. No matching error. Evaluate float instruction. Why has that happened? Oh, because I haven't returned it. Okay, so. I mean, would it be bad if this was in, yeah, there's already, it's already called instruction. I'll, I'll call this result for now. Um, Ultimately, part of my hope is that once we get rid of the rest that's threaded through everything, I, I won't need to name this intermediate value because it will just be the, it will, this will just be the last expression in the method. And so it will just return whatever this case statement returns. But for now, we're going to have to name it. Okay, so why? What's the problem? Oh, yeah, so I need all of this. Type, bits, number. And I realize that this has now been renamed, which is annoying, but this seem, this feels like an opportunity to pick better names for these things that I've just bodged in previously. Why is this happening? Evaluate float instruction const. No matching pattern error. Okay, but why is that? Why are you even trying to do that? Okay, let's just think about what's happening here. Oh, I forgot the dot. Silly. Missing keyword locals. Well, you say missing. I think what you mean is unnecessary. We don't need that yet. <sighs> okay, so it turns out I do need this regular <laughs> expression after all, because I've once I've gone back on that. Okay, and then I need to uncomment my require. Oh, now what? 
I mean, that's worrying because it looks like it might be a nil. Um, okay, let me look at my let let me look at the diff and think about it. Okay, so we've got a new struct that's got type bits and number in it. Regular expression there. I think that I think that regular expression probably matches. Oh yeah, this sort of overwrites rest, doesn't it? Like it gets assigned here and we pull the instruction out, but then here we go back to the original S expression so that we've got the instruction at the beginning. Um Oh look, this is this is wrong. I mean I'll call it result because that's what it's called inside, but then we need to return it so that it gets so that it gets added onto the end of result. So that was yet another silly mistake. Oh no what? Oh I can't call it result. <laughs> I mean, I'm really running out of instruction is also being used here, but fortunately I don't think it's, again, the same thing is going to happen here where like when I get rid of that rest argument, this will just be the return value. I won't need to name it. Um, let's call it numeric instruction. Oh. Sorry, everyone. That's not nice. Okay, but there we go. Okay, so that seems to be... Oh, I mean, there's loads of junk in here that we don't want, but... Yes to that. Yes to that. Uh, don't really want that bit. Uh, there's lots in here that we don't want. Yes. Yes. So like I said, we are hollowing out this evaluate numeric instruction function uh, and eventually there will be nothing left of it. It will be merely a husk. Um, in the meantime, there's basically a copy of its functionality over in the parser, this thing that splits up using the regular expression. But when it goes away, that will not be the case anymore. Um, get a C parse call uh, const instruction. Um, this is a bit complicated uh, so that I can gradually move over one numeric instruction at a time. I hope it's worth it. Uh, at the moment, we're not parsing the number in the parser, which seems like a mistake. I'll fix that next. I think I, I don't want to leave it like that. Like it's, it's grim. Um, so let's have a look here. Who Uh, so there are a couple of other places. Again, like I said, this is really parsing work, but at the moment I'm not trying to move this out of the interpreter as part of this unit of work. So I guess I have to leave interpret integer or make it available here at least. Um, the other thing is just using Wasmin a float, so that's fine. I'm just trying to think like what, 
if I want to move this out, what do I have to move? I'm going to have to copy interpret integer, not not move it. And it looks like this uses unsigned as well. Yeah, that makes sense because you can have an unsigned integer. Oh, sorry, you can have a signed integer here. You can have a negative number, but we store everything as unsigned. Um, it's a little bit odd, isn't it? Like you can't distinguish between anyway whatever it's it's not for me to think about um let's pull this code out uh i guess these can go down here i don't really know how to decide what order to put methods in um oh and this needs mask um is that what it's called yes um and having done that, I think this piece of code here needs to go away and needs to just become stack.push number. So actually, I don't think the type, I don't think we need the only reason to have type and bits in const is to provide an interpretation of the number but if the number's already been interpreted by the parser then i don't think we need that anymore so i think that ast could just be number i mean maybe value was a better name for that but i've changed it now so i'm not changing it back um, and then here, uh, instead of just saying const new, we can say yeah. I guess here now I can call this string, <laughs> and then this can be number equals case type. We're not going to need this bit. So case type in integer, let's just finally call this parse integer because that's what it should have been called in the first place. String bits else. So. I think that's right. So if it's an integer, then parse it. If it's a float, then parse it. Uh, we're going to need float up here. We're going to need a bigger float. Um, so now, yes, we really don't care about that information. I think I mean I don't actually know do I I think I'm gonna leave these in and I'll tell you why because at some point I'm gonna to want to implement the validation phase that runs on top of this abstract syntax tree and I'm pretty sure that that is going to need to know the type of this constant. And that's really encoded in the type and bits there. So even though they're not needed in the evaluator, I sort of feel confident enough that I'm going to need them in the future, that I'm going to leave them in here. And that will just have to form the answer to the question of, why are they here when they're not needed? I think my first instinct to put them in there was probably correct. Um, and also it makes this commit a bit smaller. Okay, so that's right. We need the float and the mask helpers. Um, 
Yeah, so we want to add that. No, we don't want any of that junk. And yes, we do want that. And yes, we do want that. Okay, cool. Um, so this is something like parse numbers in AST parser, parse const uh, argument in AST parser. not the interpreter, interpreter. And yeah, I'll just say, although the interpreter doesn't need them, I've left uh, bits, uh, type and bits on the const struct because I think we will need them. I don't know why I didn't type that emphasis. I think we will need them for verification and I'd rather just make them, make that information available. I'd rather just, I'd rather keep that information available so that it's just there when we need it. Okay, and I, I guess I'll kind of try and remember that for some of the rest of these numeric instructions that even, well, I mean, I don't know if we're gonna have the opportunity. I was gonna say, even if we have other instructions that have that sort of property, but uh, const might be the only one actually. Um, okay, so what's next? I've still got some, I've still got, I'm still awake is what I'm trying to say. Although my inability to say that is doesn't bode well for its veracity. Um, load. So if we got this and make it so that it doesn't execute load and instead load gets executed up here. Um, Well, I guess I actually want all of this. Um, so that's something. And then over in the parser. Oh, I've already got this. Okay. So this bit's definitely parsing. And in this case, the zero makes sense because, yeah, because the offset is optional, but because zero is the identity for addition, that's the same as saying the default static offset is zero. So I think that makes sense. Um, popping the stack is execution. That's all execution. Um, so on this side, what we want is for the load to have a static offset. And I think the fact that it's part of the instruction is enough um, to make it, you know, well, what I'm trying to say is the name doesn't need to specify that it's static because it's part of the abstract syntax tree. So everything in the AST is static, but I guess for the purposes of its local variable here, we, we, can, we can put that into a local variable called static offset. And then what we get off the stack is the essentially the dynamic offset. And then here we load the value off the stack and we push it. I think that tap is not doing very much here. Let's just give it a name. Um, value. Um, so how does the, how does bits work here? I just realized that load and store are not numeric operations as far as this is concerned. I've categorized numeric operations as being ones that start with I32 or I64, but that's not quite how, or indeed at all, how they're categorized in the spec. So 
I've gone a bit, I've gone slightly rogue there. Um, so the memarg here, when it's a load instruction, oh, hold on. Oh, right. So this is, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, fine. It's, it's, it's another one of these. It's just got bits at the start. Um, oh, and it's also got type. It's also got type, but we don't use that because our representation of, we represent everything as uh, unsigned integers anyway. So we don't need that information. But here, what I'm anticipating is that we're going to do load.new and we're going to remember the type and we're going to remember the bits and we're going to remember the offset. It doesn't need to be called static offset here. Uh, let's split this into Yeah. Yeah, and that's that's optionally mutating rest. So again, that this is an optional offset argument. And then we have to split it and integerify it, otherwise it's zero. And then we store the type and the bits. Um, we're not actually using the type at the moment, but Okay, I think that's all correct. I think that's all correct. <laughs> Except this bit. Oh, offset. Um, I think I need to update my regular expression so that we go down this path at the right time. So this needs to be const or load. And I need to stop calling that static offset because it is not anymore. Okay, that'll do for now. Uh, don't need all this. Great. Um, Pass load instruction. Is there anything in what I waffled about that is worth talking about here? Um, maybe, again, we're storing the type in the AST somewhat speculatively because the interpreter doesn't need to know it. Floats are just stored as integers anyway. Um, okay, well, we're getting, well, I mean, I'm getting tired, but also we're getting close to being done with this bit. So let's see if I can finish this part off. Um, so there's going to be an in store. I predict that this is going to look much the same. Oh, actually, exactly the same. Because it doesn't, of course, it doesn't, I was like, oh, it needs the number to store, but... But that comes off the stack.
Um, sorry, it should come from down here where I can delete it. So all of that comes up here. Um, but that's all parsing. This is where we get the value, which arguably should be called number or whatever, but that's that's how we've implemented store, so that's fine. So that's that's it. Um, on the parsing side, it looks exactly the same as load, I've just realized. So um, I think I'm going to do this business again. Uh, is it still instruction? Operation. Because, yeah, we've, this, is, this is a piece of the instruction name that we've pulled out after the I32 or whatever, because the I is now in the type and the 32 is now in the bits. Um, so I need to add that to the AST. But otherwise, is that ready to work? No, I need to add it to the regular expression. This is going to go away when I've... when everything's hooked up, right? Oh, what is my problem? Line 307. Oh, yeah. Good point. That's not syntactically valid, Ruby. Um, although I don't really understand why not, but Fine. Okay. Yes. I mean, having that, keeping that regular expression there is really not helping me out. Uh, Okay. All right. Um, that's come quite a long way. Uh, how hard is it? Oh, look, it's not hard at all. It's not hard at all. I just need a bin op and a un op. <laughs> um, all right, look, I can do this. This is a Unix system. I know this. I can I can do this in the next minutes. More than five, less than 15, and then it's my bedtime. But I can basically be done with this, which would be fantastic. I'd be very happy if I felt like I was done with it. Um, okay, look, this is easy. Uh, uh, and I think to make it less annoying... I'm just going to do this all in one because otherwise it's going to take more time and I think this is sufficiently straightforward that I can, I now feel confident that I can just do this in a, I can leap this building in a, in a single bound. Um, so I think these can become pars pause operation I don't think I care about how many bits it is hold on oh I'm such an I'm such a Oh, 
I've been really silly in my thinking about this because I was thinking that it's complicated to do this because those operations have got different arities. But of course, the parser only cares about their static arity. And I think they all have a static arity of zero. I think they're all nullary. So we don't even need this. We don't need this. All we need to do is remember the name of the operation and how many bits it is. So this is going to be as simple as like numeric dot new bits operation. Oh, I guess type. That's all we need to know. We don't need to we don't need to do any more parsing there. If if it's not const load or store then it's one of the many numeric instructions um, and none of them have any static arguments as you can see they're all nullary so I don't need I actually don't need to do any parsing here I just need to say, whelp, it, I know it's not one of the ones that has static arguments, it's just a numeric, and it's for a 64-bit flow, and it, the operation is called add, and that's all I need from an AST point of view. So here I just need numeric uh, type bits operation, again, whether that's the right name, I don't know, but there is the word op, or the op, operation does appear here um i mean i'm also using this to cover tests and comparisons and conversions but maybe i should call it something like numeric op also the other reason i'm saying that is because numeric is a is a ruby class name is a class of course because it's just because you it's a it's a super class of integer and, and uh float and so forth um i think this possibly better encapsulates what it is because it's going to be one of these a unary op or a binary op um so i think that for both reasons is a better name for now Maybe at some point I do want to, actually it would be useful, uh, it would actually be useful to have broken it, broken them down by dynamic arity. Um, because then these regular expression, these pattern matches, yeah, maybe that's the next thing to do, is to move that, is to push that back into the parser. But right now, um, certainly f for the purposes of getting to a stable stopping point, I think here, if I create a numeric op, that will communicate the type and the bits and the operation name. Um, should I call this name? No, I'll, I'll leave it as operation for now. Uh, okay, what does that mean from the perspective of the interpreter? think it means in numeric op type bits uh, operation um, I don't need to get rest anymore I think evaluate numeric instruction has now it, it doesn't affect rest at all and it just calls either integer or float depending on the type. So I can just do that up there. Um, these could actually take an instruction argument now that I look at it. Um, but let's see if I can make it work with the existing interface. In fact, maybe the thing to do here is to say that if type is integer and if type is float, 
I can put the conditional right in there. So this can be evaluate integer instruction operation bits. Is that what it was? Yes. Uh, and presumably here, this is evaluate float instruction. There's no reason these need to be two separate methods, but you know, whatever. Um, they are currently. Uh, and I think I can take this out now because we're not using that anymore. So yeah, if it's fallen through, well, not really. If it's if the parser has fallen through to assuming it has to be a numeric operation, then it's going to communicate this node type, and then we're going to switch on the, you know, I could have had separate integer op and float op, but you know why slice things along that axis? Um, so I think is this going to work? No. What have I done wrong? Oh, I need to f completely open this up now. So that everything falls through to that method. Yes. Um, let's run the full tests while I make the commit. So, yes. So let's say pause all other numeric instructions. Okay, that's looking good. Um, do I want to try and do this maneuver? Well, I'll tell you what, let's change the signatures of these to just take the instruction. And then this can just say instruction goes into operation bits. Oh, that's not how it works. Um, Similarly, down here, so I think that's just fine. Um, pass instruction into evaluate uh, integer float instruction methods. Um, it has all the information these methods need and could potentially know more, e.g. the arity, uh, the, yeah, the dynamic arity of that operation. Okay, so that's, I guess that's the last thing I would like to do is can I make it so that this mess that identifies the arity of the operation actually lives in the parser? You know, we can have this binary op, unary op 
well, at the very least, that sort of subdivision, maybe we should actually divide them up like this. At the moment, they're slightly arbitrarily divided up into just integer ones and floating point ones. Maybe this division from the abstract syntax is like a more sensible one, but just with respect to the separation that currently exists, maybe here I could um, I could just inline like at the moment it looks like this um, that you know that's that's no change from what I had before but Here, there's a big case statement <laughs> that finds all of the binary operations, and then there's another clause that finds all of the unary operations. I mean, obviously, I could, I could have just given numeric operation a another attribute called arity or something. Um, maybe that would have been better, but it's not arbitrary. Like, it's there's no enary operation here. They're all either unary or binary. So I think actually promoting it to the level of like a different AST class here helps to make it clear that it's not general it's like there are two choices they're either binary or unary operations um and i think that's yeah if that what i just said is true then that is it um hold on yeah that's all the integer ones where does the float ones start where do they start here Okay, and like I said, this is basically an arbitrary division, but it's the one that currently exists, so I'll go with it. Um, yeah, you can see there are subdivisions inside here to do with whether the output is a floating point number or whatever, so then it might be convenient for me to have different kind of a different organization here, but for right now just being able to segregate them at this level. So that means this is no longer a thing. This becomes binary op and unary op. I mean, that does feel like the wrong way around for them, doesn't it? <laughs> um, but that's the way around they are in everything. I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna put them the right way around here because really you'd expect binary to, you know, one argument and then two arguments uh, makes more sense. Um, oh no, screw it. I'll keep them in the same, sorry. I'll keep them in the same order as they are in the evaluator for now, but in the AST file, I'll put them in the, the sensible order. Um, So that just means that in here, well, okay, let's think about further up. Much further up, it turns out. Um, you, uh, Owen is saying, going back to your remark about the unsigned usage, unary sub tends to be an odd one since the op needs to be evaluated against the number before the signage takes effect. Unary sub. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's all already, I think that's all already taken care of. I think I had to deal with that 
really early on actually as one of the first things I needed to I needed to deal with I mean there isn't we there's not an instruction that does that but notationally um Yeah, I'm not quite sure what you mean by unary sub, I'm sorry. Um, but yeah, it was def it's definitely, I definitely found it fiddly to get the signed and unsigned interpretation stuff in the right, uh, like the right point in the pipeline, because if you do it too soon or too late, then that's wrong. <laughs> so I've definitely found it challenging to um, to make that work right. Right, I see what you're saying. Yeah, you're talking about like unary minus. Yeah, which, which, well, there's a neg um, for floats, but there isn't really, well, I mean, I guess that is what neg does. Um, uh, but yeah, for integers, there is no unary minus. You just, it's just like syntactically when you put a minus sign in front of it, you have to negate the number, but then, you know, you have to, you know, especially if it's a hex number, it, it makes you think about like, well, what does that mean? <laughs> How, what number is that supposed to be representing? So I definitely had to, in some of the earlier episodes, I definitely had to work through some of the details of that to make sure that the essentially what you're talking about unary negation actually works correctly. Um, but it's, it's not really done by the evaluator. It's actually taken care of in this, you know, this business here about, I went back and forth on lots of different ways of dealing with the, this is the handling of the unary minus here is like, you know, as you can see, what it does is it says delete prefix here. That's just for the purpose of deciding whether the string starts with a hex ident. You know that this hex sort of leading identifier, um, but the minus sign is left in the string, so that like when we turn it into an integer, we let Ruby take care of giving us a signed integer back, and then this business of just like well, then you have to convert it to an unsigned integer. And at, at one point, I was doing those things. I was stripping the minus sign off and then I was coming up with the number and then I was just negating it and that was going wrong in all sorts of ways. So yeah, I've I've messed that up already. <laughs> um, but fortunately, a long, a long time ago, such that I can barely remember the details now. Um, okay, so hold on, what, what the hell am I doing? In the evaluator, now this needs to be um oh yeah I and mean, that makes sense yeah yeah that's I, I guess that was if i did have unary um if i did have unary negation as an operation uh for the for the virtual machine then i think it, yeah that would be another reason to kind of keep those two things separate but in this case it's just it's how i happen to have organized my code just because i wanted to because you have to pop the right number of arguments off the stack. And if I hadn't organized these by arity, I would have, in every single implementation here, I would have had to say, pop two things off the t stack, pop two things off the stack, and then down here, pop one thing off the stack. So really, it was just for sort of economy of code that I've organized things by arity, not for any high-minded reason. Um, but it has worked out quite conveniently. Um, so now I have to do the thing again where I'm like, if it's in unary op or binary op, um, oh, actually, I don't need to project any bits and pieces out of it. I just need to know the type. Um, so maybe the way I'll do that is like this. Case instruction in type integer evaluate integer instruction in type float evaluate float instruction I think that's right 
And that's why I was packaging it up and just passing the instruction through is so here I don't need to care about anything except what the type is uh, and then the, you know, the bits and the operation will be carried through as part of the instruction itself. And then down here, I do need to know what the operation is, but now this can be, how can I, how should I write this? I think I can just make this a case on the instruction and say, um, in uh, binary op, <laughs> um, and what do I care about? Just the bits? Yes, because we've already checked that it's an integer operation. And then down here, instead of this big old thing, we're just checking that it's a unary op. And then I think I can do the same thing here. So this is case instruction. Oh, it's a little bit more complicated because I need to know the bits so that I can get the format for the float. So I can do that. Oh, hold on. I also, uh, sorry, I also, oh, I'm in the wrong. Hold on, I'm losing my mind. It's also extremely important that I get the operation. That's what I forgot. Um, you know, that's really, if anything, more important. <laughs> Um, we need to know the bits and we need to know the operation. But here again, uh, so these are uh, in binary op. We need to know, well actually at this point, we don't need to know the bits. Or do we? Yeah, some of these still check it. It's a, it's a bit, uh, bit of a legacy, um, bit of a legacy, but here, actually, I don't think any of the binary ones do need to know the number of bits, but just to keep it consistent, let's say that in general, we need to know, in some places, we still need to know whether it's a 32-bit or a 64-bit float, in addition to, well, the thing is, we've got the format, uh, <laughs> It's fine, it's fine. This all, this can all be cleaned up later. Um, so hold on, I'm a bit skeptical of what I've done here. I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm, maybe I shouldn't be skeptical. I mean, the thing that occurs to me is that no, it's okay. What I was going to say was that this doesn't really need to branch based on type. I could just aggregate <laughs> these lists. Um, because this is just trying to map operation name onto arity and actually, you know, either so some of some of these operations identify are identifiably only for integers or floats, like shift right unsigned is an integer operation. You can't do that on floats. Copy sign is a float operation. You can't do that on integers. Um, so for those ones, it's it would be fine to coalesce them because there's no confusion about, you know, whether it was an integer or a float. But even for the ones where there is confusion, like add, they're still by, you know, the arity is the same. Like the, the execution is different, but the arity is the same. Um, 
so I actually could combine those but I think keeping it strict like this is probably a good idea even though it's not strictly necessary no pun intended um, let's run the tests here oh well that didn't last long evaluate float instruction length mismatch given one expected two okay what am I doing um, I don't understand. Four, seven, six. I'm looking in the wrong place. That's why I don't understand. Oh, I somehow copied. I don't know how I did that, but I somehow copied the, the stack pop line. That was, that was not right. Okay, that's looking hopeful. I think it would have failed by now if I'd screwed this up. Um, is there any way I can do this more neatly? I think maybe I can because I just realized that I'm not actually... I'm not actually binding anything here. So I think I can just say type integer binary op type integer and then just do this directly and then just do the same for floats I think that's okay and I think that's a little nicer than having that sort of nested you know I think as long as as for as much as I can get away with doing the discrimination in the pattern match rather than sort of doing a top level pattern match and then having to look I can actually do that I can actually do that here as well mm, that's don't get distracted by that okay so what have I done here um What did I do previously? Oh, yeah. So before that. Okay, so I still need those, yeah, I still need those evaluate instruction methods. Okay. So this is something like split numeric op into unary op and binary op. Um, this, uh, prevents the interpreter from having to, um, well, let's just say this makes it easier for the interpreter to pop the right number of arguments off the stack. It ultimately still needs to know all the instruction names so that it can actually execute them but this is a small but knowing the arity ahead of time is a small convenience yeah I mean the parsers got bigger the interpreters got smaller. <laughs> that feels like the right trade-off. Um, so now I think I'm done with the hand over hand part of it. And so I think what that means is that no one cares about rest anymore. Just like in web app design. So this while loop can just turn into expression dot each do instruction.
and then rest goes away entirely, which was what I wanted. I wanted this to just be a big loop, just iterate over every instruction in this instruction sequence and execute it. And that appears to be what it is now capable of doing. Um, I mean, I'm extremely tempted to extract evaluate instruction, which I think I am going to do, but let's just do this first. So uh, replace evaluate while loop with each. Um, we no longer, uh, the parser, the AST parser now handles all, ki all types of instruction. So we no longer need to worry about uh, consuming the correct number of elements from the array. We can definitely just take them one at a time and each will be a complete instruction ready to be evaluated. And now I'll just pull out that whole bit. I mean, that's helping with my mental model of like, um, what to call things. Cause this is definitely like the expression is a sequence of instructions. And now it's very clear just by looking at what, I mean, like I said, this should really be evaluate expression, but you can see it takes an argument called expression. What that does is just iterate over every instruction and then evaluate it. So this is the, this is the real heart of our, what is now increasingly represent, uh, a resembling a VM. This is the real heart of it. This is the heart of the this is where the instruction dispatch happens is that we're picking the right implementation based on the, the op code essentially, even though we don't call it that. Um, and then that's just for organization's sake, that's decomposed into a couple of other functions here. And like I said, I think maybe these functions could be broken up more into, you know, evaluate binary integer instruction, evaluate binary float instruction, evaluate unary integer instruction and so on, evaluate float comparison instruction um, and potentially bake more of, instead of having these strings hanging around, the, each of these could be different classes of node in the AST, but that's, that's a problem for another day, I think. Um, so does that mean, oh yeah, let's, I'm yammering away, I haven't actually committed this. Um, extract, evaluate, instruction. Um, yeah, I don't think I have anything to say about that. Um, so, incrementally extract parsing parts of evaluate et al to ast parse the parse expression i have done that that is done um is there anything dead left over here that i'm not using anymore i think i'm still using float yeah again this is in a part of code that should really be in the interpreter uh, in the in the in the parser but it's not so that's a problem for another day um i think i got rid of the regular expression yeah um Yeah, that's all part of the arithmetic stuff. And yeah, unfortunately, we still need this interpret integer function, uh, again, that should live in, for bits of the code that should live in the parser. So I guess um, you know, there's another thing here that's like uh, support 
um, parsing, modules, function definitions, etc. Uh, so that we can move this junk out of the out of the interpreter and have an AST nodes for modules and function definitions and whatever else can exist at the level in tables that I, I don't know what they are yet and things like that. Um, now I'm going to stop there because it is nearly 2 a.m. Um, this this is the, I was hoping I could get this done today, but this will just have to be for next time. Um, as I said at the beginning of this stream, there is really now no reason for this parser to, to keep this rest argument around. It could just be chomping things off the beginning of the S expression. Um, but I think that's going to be well, it's going to be more than a couple of minutes work to get that working uh, and I'll probably break it loads of times and get confused and especially as I get more sleepy, it's, um, it's diminishing returns. So for now, 37 commits, not bad, or maybe it is bad, I don't know. Maybe it has zero moral content that is also possible hey where's my thingy where's my thingy what <laughs> github you can't do this to me oh great Everything's working normally. <laughs> um, okay, well, that's rather disappointing because this is the thing I look forward to at the end is seeing the tests run on GitHub. But clearly for one reason or another, that's not going to happen. Um... Can I trigger this manually? Uh, I don't know how. Is this one of these things where if I make my window arbitrary, arbitrarily larger, I get more UI? Um, Oh well. Well, that's a separate. I mean, maybe I've just you know, I don't know. I don't pay for GitHub. I don't know how many actions minutes I get or whatever. So maybe that's maybe I, maybe I just need to pay them some money to keep running my tests. I I don't know. Um, if I had to put money on it right now, I would just say I would just assume that GitHub is having some kind of outage that they're not uh, admitting to. So. Um, you know, I d obviously I don't know whether that's true, but I'll find out after this. Um, anyway, I think that's it. Uh, I think it's time for me to go to sleep. Um, I feel good about that. I feel like I've, I've basically done what I said I was going to do. I've introduced the AST. I haven't polished it to a high shine, but there is now all of that parsing you know, concern is now out of the interpreter. So I'm, I'm very happy about that. Um, like I said, that's basically where I wanted to get to. And I am now there. So uh, that's a relief. Um, all right. Well, that's going to be it for today. Um, thank you very much for watching. Uh, I hope that some of that was interesting or useful or, you know, I don't know, vaguely vaguely relevant to your life um but i'll say goodbye for now um and yeah i'll be carrying on again soon so please join me for the next one bye bye